Good afternoon. It is so exciting to see all of you here gathered for this occasion. It's been a very exciting morning already, and now we continue on this occasion. So I'm very proud to be able to kick off this afternoon's event of the State of Science of the U.S. Fire Administrator's Summit on Fire Prevention and Control. But as we kick off this afternoon, there are many of you who were not able to participate this morning in our roundtable discussion. And so I want to share not only some photos with those in the room and those who are joining us live, welcome to you as well. But I want you to see some photos from the morning and I want to recap just a little bit of the discussion because this morning marked a historic event where we had leaders who were here to listen. The roundtable discussion had representation from the White House with Senior Director Caitlin Durkovich from the National Security Council Resilience and Response. We had with us virtually the Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas to join us to offer comments. We had also the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security present to listen. We also had the FEMA Administrator, Deanne Criswell, who is from our ranks here in the room to listen. We also had members, prominent members of the Fire Service to represent you. I want those members who are present with us this afternoon to stand as well. So first of all, Chief Donna Black was here to offer comment on your behalf, the President of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. <laughs> Chief Kevin Quinn from the National Volunteer Fire Council. <laughs> General President Ed Kelly from the International Association of Firefighters. Chief Ernie Mitchell, representing the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation and former U.S. Fire Administrator. And Mr. Jim Pauley, President and CEO of the National Fire Protection Association. I will just say they represented you well. As the leaders represented this morning spoke with one voice, all of those people representing those major organizations did not speak for their organization. They spoke for you, one voice of the fire service. They talked about partnering, they talked about answering and stepping up to tackle currently um, challenges currently facing the fire service. We must address these issues, is what Deputy Secretary Tian said. We must address them with urgency from Secretary Mayorkas, as he expressed the department's commitment to fight for resources that you need. He said that you should not have to struggle for the resources you need to save lives. Deputy Secretary Tian also offered that DHS will have a partnership in this mission. The FEMA Administrator told us that leadership is listening. Together, we must define solutions necessary to protect all responders. The work today is an investment in our future and the future of the next generation of the fire service. And Director Durkovich emphasized that firefighters are foundational to the resilience of our communities. The fire service leaders each represented an issue and a fire problem or a challenge to firefighter health and safety from a much wider lens. The roundtable participants highlighted some of these issues. First, we must provide all firefighters, both career and volunteer, with the training and equipment to meet the challenges they now face due to climate change and the threat of wildfire in the interface. There was an opportunity for fire service to take a leadership role in helping communities prepare for the effects of climate change and the impact on our responders. Other statements, we also discussed uh, the decline of firefighter recruitment and retention. 
One solution suggested is to invest in a national apprenticeship program to address the shortage of firefighters and to make the fire service more diverse and inclusive. Another issue discussed is the need to create a national comprehensive firefighter cancer strategy considering the link between cancer and on-the-job exposures. We have a need for firefighter health screenings and we must reduce PFOS exposure, particularly in our gear. Another statement, the next generation of PPE must be developed and manufactured and the replacement gear disposed of safely. The point was made by General President Kelly that early detection is key in firefighter cancer diagnosis. We are responsible for, for protecting those who protect us. We talked a lot about mental health. Chief Mitchell noted that there's still a stigma associated with behavioral health issues, and we must develop a holistic approach to help all our responders. Finally, we discussed the need to make safer communities by enforcing codes and standards. Jim Pauley said that safe housing and affordable housing should not be mutually exclusive. Code adoption moves forward, but enforcement is where the problem begins. We must incentivize local communities to ensure that they are using the latest building codes. And finally, the 2022 Presidential Proclamation for the 100th Fire Prevention Week was presented by Director Durkovich, and it had been signed by President Joe Biden. The speaker's testimonies were consistent with what you will hear this afternoon during the state of science. Each speaker that will come forward today will bring a perspective on where we are on the current issues and where we face gaps in particularly addressing the fire problem and firefighter health and safety in our country. After the National Roundtable, Commissioner Teal this morning led a discussion of the observers in the group where we consistently recorded the feedback beyond the roundtable. Today, we will be recording that same conversation as we move through the afternoon. So everything that is said in this room today will become historic record for the proceedings of this summit. So this was but a brief snapshot of the morning. And with feedback already from the participants, the observers this morning, it was a historic event. I can't begin to tell you how very important this summit is. We've identified some very real issues and we have a lot of work yet to do. I really wanna thank everyone for being here to step forward and to participate in the morning events and now we've expanded it in the afternoon events with not only our audience in-house, but to our virtual audience who is watching live this afternoon. Now, I'd like to introduce a very good friend. Ron Sarnicki is the former fire chief of Prince George's County, Maryland, Fire and EMS Department. He's been an executive director in the Nash of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation for the past 21 years and he is a true champion of firefighter safety. I can tell you that this partnership between the USFA and the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation is what has led us to where we are today. Without that partnership, USFA would not have been able to pull off this event. Chief Sarnicki, if you will join me, please. So good afternoon. First of all, thank you for joining us for today's State of Science as part of the United States Fire Administrators Summit on Fire Prevention and Control. It is a real privilege and honor to support Dr. Lori Moore Merrill's efforts 
to reduce the impact of fire in America. The Foundation is very proud to work side by side with the United States Fire Administration on so many projects, but especially in providing this opportunity for the American Fire Service and more importantly, the individuals who are working to keep our community safe. What better place to gather for this event than here at the National Fire Academy? Only steps away from the National Fallen Firefighters Memorial. And for those of you watching, it's at Emmitsburg, Maryland. Two days ago, the nation gathered here to honor 148 firefighters who made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their communities. Every year after the memorial, I reflect on what we as an organization and as an industry and as a nation can do to reduce the number of families, friends, and callings who have been affected by the loss of a firefighter. All of us owe it to those who have lost a firefighter to do all in our power to prevent another firefighter from dying and to prevent the public from suffering any loss from such an occurrence. To those of you in the audience today and watching virtually, we hope the presentations motivate you to get more involved in supporting solutions to address the fire problem in America. As I look out into the audience, I see many friends and colleagues from our National Fire Service organizations and research institutes who I've had the pleasure of working with for the past 21 years. I also see, though, 100 firefighter recruits from Prince George's County, Maryland, Loudoun County, Virginia, and the District of Columbia. All of you recruits, please stand. Please be seated. Yeah, they won't sit down unless you tell them. <laughs> I asked you to stand because you are the future of the American Fire Service. And being a part of this historic event is going to set you on a journey to learn so much about what's happening in your industry. And I would like to take a second to speak to those recruits personally. You're beginning a very significant journey in a pivotal time in our fire service history. I have to say over my fire service career, I have seen new technologies making it easier for firefighters to stay out of harm's way. The knowledge of fire behavior continues to change and how we operate on the fire ground are lessons that have been learned. And we now know more about the actions we can personally take to decrease our chances of firefighter injuries and deaths. Each of you recruits are now responsible for learning as much as possible about the distinct aspects of being a firefighter during your fire service career. A long-standing value of the fire service is to care for your brothers and sisters. It is your responsibility to ensure you're doing everything possible to leave the fire service better than how you found it. I have to say your department leadership supported you in being here today, and we thank them for making that opportunity possible, and I ask that you do the same. The State of the Science presentations would not be possible without the commitment of the United States Fire Administration, our leader, Dr. Lori Moore Merrill, who's been a longtime champion for firefighter health and safety. I have to say, every day, Dr. Moore Merrill demonstrates her commitment to protecting the nation from fire, helping firefighters here learn about the training tools available and the equipment they need to do their job effectively, 
and she does all she can to ensure that every firefighter goes home at the end of their tour of duty. So I say to our nation's chief fire officer, Dr. Lauren Mormero, thank you. Please stand. Like any event of this magnitude, it takes resources to make it happen. The Foundation has a supportive group of partners who help ensure our success by answering the call whenever we need their help. And I would like to take a moment to thank those sponsors who provided the resources to make this event possible. Our state assigned sponsors are the National Fire Protection Association, who is our premier sponsor. Jim, please, thank you. We're fortunate to have three leading sponsors, the National Association of State Fire Marshals, the National Fire Sprinkler Association, and UL's Fire Safety and Research Institute. Please take a bow. And lastly, we have two supporters of our project today, the International Code Council and Milliken, who help fill the gap in our need for resources. Thanks to both of you. So as I conclude, I have to take a second and thank the team that made all this happen. And it was a joint effort between the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation and the United States Fire Administration. So all of those individuals that have been working behind the scenes, thank you and please stand because your efforts are truly appreciated. So collectively, we have the opportunity today to impact fire and life safety in our nation, not just in the near term, but for generations to come. I encourage all of you to take the information discussed here today back to your fire organizations, your communities, your elected officials, and share that so that we can make our nation a safer place to live, work, and play. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sarnicki. So good afternoon again. I am Lori Moore Merrill, your fire administrator. And I'd like to welcome our first panel for the State of Science this afternoon. A very distinguished panel, I might add. Our first presenter, and I'll introduce each of them, and they will then come up and speak one after the other. So we will go in that manner, panel. Our first presenter is Commissioner Adam Teal. He has served as Commissioner of the Philadelphia Fire Department since May of 2016 and is responsible for leading the department's 3,000 plus members in protecting the city from fires and all hazards emergencies. Commissioner Teal has over 30 years of government, private sector, and nonprofit experience spanning five states. Next, we have Chief Frank Lieb. Chief Lieb is a Deputy Assistant Chief for the Fire Department of New York, currently serving as Acting Chief of Training. Chief Lieb has 30 years with FDNY. He holds a, master, excuse me, a Bachelor's Degree in Fire Service Administration from the State University of New York and a Master's Degree in Security Studies from the Naval Postgraduate School, Center for Homeland Security and Defense. Chief Lieb also served as the incident commander on the Bronx Fire, which we will hear more about today. Following Chief Lieb will be Dr. Susan Moore from the National Institutes for Occupational Safety and Health, which is part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Moore is an Associate Director of Science at NIOSH's National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory.
and serves as NIOSH's Public Safety Sector Coordinator. Dr. Moore joined this audience today by her colleague, Dr. Emily Haas, whose work will be featured in part of Dr. Moore's presentation. Next will be Dr. Steve Kerber, Vice President and Executive Director for the Fire Safety Research Institute at UL Research Institutes. He leads the fire safety research team dedicated to addressing the world's unresolved fire safety risks and emerging dangers to reduce fire death, injury, and loss. Our final presenter for this panel will be Chief Shane Ray. Chief Ray serves as president of the National Fire Sprinkler Association and is on the board of directors of the Congressional Fire Services Institute. He serves as fire chief in Pleasant, Pleasant View, Tennessee. For 13 years, Chief Ray also held the position of superintendent of the South Carolina Fire Academy and South Carolina State Fire Marshal. Please welcome our first panel. Commissioner Teal, I invite you to take the podium. On behalf of all the panelists, I want to start by thanking Dr. Moore Merrill, Administrator Criswell, Department of Homeland Security leadership, and President Biden for convening this important summit today. Let's give her another round of applause. Over the past few years, our dedicated Philadelphia Fire Department dispatchers, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, Firefighters, fire marshals, and non-uniform support staff, like their colleagues nationwide, have done everything they've been asked to do in service to their communities. During the COVID-19 pandemic, our members have delivered laptops and hotspots to children at home so they could try to finish school. We've operated mass feeding, isolation, and quarantine sites, fire captains in charge of leased hotels, taking care of some of the most vulnerable victims of COVID-19. We've done vaccination and testing in neighborhoods all across Philadelphia in concert with faith-based communities and our partners in public health. At the same time, our members and law enforcement partners were the first responders to the local impacts of Hurricanes Isaias and Ida. While members of our Urban Search and Rescue Task Force, Pennsylvania Task Force One, that we sponsor under a cooperative agreement with FEMA, responded to the Surfside building collapse and are currently on their way back from Ian in Florida. And when the White House called to ask if we would serve as one of only two U.S. airports to welcome our allies home from Afghanistan, the answer was emphatically yes, as Philadelphia firefighters and medics supported our Office of Emergency Management throughout that vital mission. As any of our firefighters and medics will tell you, it's simply what we do. And then, on January 5th of 2022, the world saw what we, as firefighters, already knew. The United States has a fire problem. A fast-moving, early-morning fire in the Fairmount neighborhood of Philadelphia claimed nine children and their mothers. Families who will never have the opportunity to grow and learn and love together. 
Our response was swift. The first two engine company was stretching lines through the door within two minutes of dispatch. And if you've seen the video of that fire, every single opening in that building had heavy fire and smoke showing from that row house. They truly risked it all in an effort to save those lives, as they do every day, 24-7. 365. Despite the heroic efforts of our Rescue One, who were able to immediately rescue one child, it was simply too late for that baby. Only one person who was in that home when the fire started survived, a five-year-old boy. In the wake of this tragic incident, as the media attention subsided and reporters moved on to cover fire-related tragedies in New York and Baltimore, it became increasingly apparent to me that there was a tendency to think of this fire as an outlier, as an anomaly, something that would never happen again, or maybe to think of it as a tragic accident or worse, to blame the victims. Why were there so many people in that home? Why was that Christmas tree brought in from outside so that family could try to have a holiday on January 5th? Unfortunately, however, Severe fires are an all too common occurrence in Philadelphia and many other U.S. cities, counties, and towns of all sizes. This year alone, and I have to update these numbers since I prepared the slides, in Philadelphia, we've had 29 fire related deaths, 104 fire related injuries. 580 families displaced by fires, burned out of their homes for a total of 1,450 individuals displaced. And these aren't temporary displacements. Many of our residents don't have the benefit, the privilege of insurance. Many of these folks are rendered homeless by the scourge of fire, homeless in the sixth largest U.S. city in the richest country in the nation. Not an outlier. In 2021, our city experienced 3,332 structure fires and claimed 36 fire-related deaths all across the city. We experienced infrastructure failures, a gas explosion that claimed one life and leveled several row homes, also an all too common occurrence. Fires in every type of building all across our city. In 2020, another 39 fire related deaths, 3,884 structure fires. At the same time, our incredibly dedicated EMS providers are operating the busiest ambulance in the United States, helping folks who still don't have consistent and sustainable access to health care as their first responders. In that year, there were 129 fire-related injuries, and more than 700 families, around 720 families, were burned out of their homes in 2020. Some of them still have not been able to return. So a few of us in here are old enough to remember when the year 2000 seemed so far away, so full of promise, the 21st century. Now it seems like it was just yesterday. But you know what? It's been 20 years. We are 20 years into the new century. 
And in Philadelphia alone, 692 people have died from fires. Our neighbors are dying, suffering terrible injuries, and getting burned out of their homes. Local businesses are burning, many of them never to reopen, expanding the food deserts and exacerbating many of the inequities that are being experienced in our neighborhoods. The disproportionate impact of structure fires on BIPOC communities is more than just an issue of equity. It is a matter of justice. Thirty years ago, when I first raised my hand to take an oath, the firefighter's oath, to save lives, protect property, and help preserve the environment, I pledged my life to do whatever it took to accomplish that goal, and if necessary, to sacrifice myself for a perfect stranger. The women and men of the Philadelphia Fire Department have sacrificed too much in that service. They are willing, they are able. As I said, they'll tell you it's what we do. In just the past 10 years, Robert, Daniel, Mike, Joyce, Gabe, Kenny, Matt, Benny, Mike, Eric, John, Charlie, Terrence, and most recently, Sean Williamson, who was killed over the summer in a building collapse after a suspected arson fire. In the past six years alone, the Philadelphia Fire Department has installed more than 60,000 smoke alarms. For the past 10 years, we've had a sprinkler ordinance for new construction. Over the past three years, we've started three units that do nothing but fire prevention activity 24-7, 365. But we need more. America is still burning. We can do better. We must do better. And we cannot do it alone. Fire is everyone's fight. Thank you. And next, Frank Lieb. Good afternoon. I am honored to be here today to discuss the Twin Parks fire, which occurred in the Bronx on January 9th, 2022. Tragically, this fire resulted in 17 civilian fatalities. However, due to the Herculean effort of the FDNY, a historic number of occupants were rescued. This fire was only four days after the fire in Philadelphia, which resulted in 12 fatalities. There were now 29 civilian fire deaths in the first days of 2022. January 9th was a Sunday. I was the FDNY command chief. That means I was responsible for large-scale fires and emergencies within the city of New York. I was in my office at the fire academy that morning when the alarm came in. The fire academy is a relatively short ride to the Bronx and the Twin Parks building. My aide, driver Joe and I, began responding as the second alarm was transmitted. From the transmissions we were hearing, we knew that this was going to be a challenging fire. A third alarm was transmitted as I arrived. A fourth alarm was transmitted while I was walking up to the command post. The scene was chaotic and still escalating, with many victim removals occurring in front of the building. As expected, despite the chaos, incident command was set up and running. Firefighters and EMS personnel were performing CPR on an unimaginable number of people in front of the building, both on adults and on children. Firefighters were performing heroic acts and life-saving acts inside and outside of the building in an effort to save lives. The building is a 19-story fireproof structure. The building has both duplex and single-level apartments. Duplex apartments are apartments that occupy two levels. 
The fire began in apartment 3N. There are 120 apartments in this building. At the time of the fire, 118 apartments were occupied. Fire was discovered at approximately 10.50 a.m. However, notification of the fire department was delayed. The first phone call was made at approximately 10.54 a.m. There were numerous open doors within the building, both apartment doors and stairwell doors. These open doors allowed the toxic smoke to quickly contaminate several public halls and the stairwells within the building. FDNY units arrived on scene within three minutes. While responding, the first two companies, Engine 48 and Ladder 56, were already receiving reports from our dispatcher of unconscious people. Smoke had already filled the stairwells and several hallways prior to FDNY extinguishment efforts. A fifth alarm assignment would eventually be called, bringing hundreds of firefighters and EMS personnel to the scene. In total, more than 60 residents were transported by ambulance to local hospitals. More than 30 of these residents were transported in cardiac arrest. As mentioned, the fire began in apartment 3N and quickly spread across the hall to apartment 3J. Both of these apartments had their doors open. The entire hallway was incinerated. Despite the punishing fire conditions encountered, our units, our members, made their way down the hallway to save lives, control the open apartment doors, and extinguish fire. Ingrained in the FDNY culture is a winning mindset. In the FDNY, we play to win every day of every run of every tour. You see, it's our sworn responsibility to be ready for them the residents of this and any other structure that we respond to. FDNY firefighters and EMS personnel are well trained and prepared. However, at this fire, we operated with so much stacked against us. Even for the FDNY, with NFPA 1710 compliance staffing and exceptionally well trained firefighters and EMS medical personnel, we were challenged. Simply stated, we had done everything we could to save many lives. And I was a witness to this and saw our training and preparation did not let us down. To be clear, again, there were many heroic and amazing actions inside and outside the building by both fire and EMS members. However, it was not enough. It was not enough to save every life. While this fire is historic, it is not unprecedented. As the fires in Philadelphia and New York demonstrate, we continue to have a fire problem in this country. Additionally, as the fire administrator mentioned this morning, that a civilian has lost their life every day this year in the U.S. with the exception of one day, January, uh, June 8th. We must not lose sight of the impact that these fires have on our communities. I visited this building many times following the fire, and I witnessed the overwhelming grief of the families and the community. Families, mostly immigrants, were now displaced, placing an increased pressure on existing housing stock. They were simply pursuing the American dream. The victims are not just numbers or statistics. They are mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, children, and friends. They were valuable members of their community. We must advocate for preventive, preventive measures such as sprinklers, smoke alarms, residential education programs, and two-way voice communication systems. We must also find innovative ways to fund these initiatives, especially for our multifamily public housing. Another important point is the significance of research and effective fire safety messaging. Closed doors save lives. All 17 victims who perished died from smoke inhalation and at some point during the fire either left their apartment or left their apartment doors open. Accidental fires are still going to occur. People are going to cook, 
smoke, use candles, overload electrical outlets, and use space heaters to stay warm. We, as fire safety advocates, must champion and find ways to leverage the tools available to increase fire and life safety, which account for these human activities. Building occupants as well as firefighters continue to lose their lives in structures with inadequate fire protection features. Collectively, we must not squander the opportunity this tragic fire presents and better protect residential high-rise housing. If not us, who? If not us, when? I would like to extend a special thank you to our U.S. Fire Administrator, Dr. Lori Merrill Moore for her unwavering support and leadership of the U.S. Fire Service. I would also like to extend a thank you to FDNY leadership, our Chief of Department, John Hodgins, our Fire Commissioner, Laura Cavanaugh, and the rest of the FDNY staff chiefs who are dedicated public servants and set the standard every day in New York City. I would be remiss if I did not thank the FDNY Bureau of Fire Investigations and Chief Fire Marshal Daniel Flynn for their assistance in developing this presentation and the exemplary job they do every day. Finally, a humble and grateful thank you to the past and current members of the FDNY, fire, EMS, and civilian employees for their unwavering dedication to the life-saving mission of the FDNY. And a very special thank you to those working today to ensure the safety of those we are sworn to protect. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Dr. Susan Moore. Thank you. So you heard earlier when Dr. Moore Merle introduced me that I were called NIOSH. Many of you in the room or on the phone uh, joining us today may be familiar with my organization because you wear a NIOSH approved SCBA on your back when you go in to fight fires. Today I want to talk to you about other efforts that we have at NIOSH that are there to support the health and safety of the fire service. And specifically I want to talk about some of the activities we have related to equity. So first, I want to start off with making you aware that at NIOSH, we are spearheading a national strategy for equitable PPE protections. As part of this strategy, when we talk about equity, we're looking at how you use PPE in the fire service, how available it is to you, how accessible it is to you when you need it, how acceptable its design is for you, and how much knowledge is out there. We're looking for those inequities. Just like to make you aware that on November 8th and 9th, we're going to have a virtual workshop that all are invited. November 8th and 9th, we're going to have a virtual workshop that all are invited to participate in, where we explore these PPE equity issues, try to understand what they are and what the barriers and gaps are that allow them to exist. I also want to make you aware of some unique and innovative ways that we're trying to address PPE equity issues. If you see on the screen there, you'll see we're talking about crowdsourcing challenges. This is a way where we can engage new people to find solutions to challenging and complex PPE issues. Most recently, we just finished a challenge where we selected five winners for protective clothing fit. As part of this challenge, turnout gear was listed, and several of the award winners had ideas for how we could address fit-related issues that many women or racial and ethnic minorities are experiencing when it comes to the turnout gear that they receive. But I want to spend the rest of my time talking about one specific research effort that we've done, and I want to talk about how that approach that we use can be applied to many other issues in the fire service, and we can use it to affect many outcomes. Specifically looking at how we can link data on community vulnerability to fire service outcomes of interest. So when I talk about community vulnerability, the way we measure this is our parent organization, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, have established something called a social vulnerability index. This index is a measure of how external stressors can negatively impact community member health. And if you look on the screen on the left side, you're going to see the four themes that we use to measure a community's vulnerability. You're going to see socioeconomic status, household composition or disability. It's who lives in your homes. Okay? 
looking at racial and ethnic minorities or language considerations, housing and transportation accessibility. I want you to look at theme three for a moment. I'm going to use that throughout the presentation. The sub-themes, the information and data that goes into calculating a community's social and vulnerability theme three is looking at the percent of people in the community that have identified as belonging to a racial or ethnic minority or the percent who speak English less than well. If you just please take a moment, look at the graph that's a map on the right-hand side. This is from one of our partnering fire departments. This is the response area, these are the communities that they serve. Any of the communities that are in a dark teal color, these are communities that score very high in vulnerability for two, theme three, whereas the absence of color indicates a community that has a very low vulnerability for this particular theme. We can have the same maps and same data for all of the themes for any community. What we can do is take this community vulnerability data and pair it with other data sources that are, have outcomes of interest to the fire service. I want you to imagine pairing this data with the number of structural fires that are being seen around the department, for your department and where you service. Think about the types of ignition sources you're experiencing. Think about the number and type of personnel and apparatus that are getting deployed. Or think about how you can inform effective evacuation strategies by looking at what's what parts of community vulnerability are influencing your outcomes. You could also look at how exposures to infectious disease are affected by community vulnerability. For the sake of us demonstrating the value and utility of this method and this approach, we at the CDC NIOSH use the infectious disease consideration to do a case study. So we partnered with a fire department in Ohio, one in New York State, and one in Massachusetts. And we worked with them to ensure they were all three using the same standardized data analysis technique and software. That way we could do an apples to apples comparison with the data that we got. We, across the sampling period we looked at, we had 160,000 calls. Now take a look at the map in the bottom left. See the three red circles? I want you to notice that the circles show areas that have that teal green color. That means all three fire departments that we work with for this project serviced vulnerable communities. What we did is we took those 160,000 data calls and we looked to see how many of them had been coded by the 911 operator as potentially being related to an infectious disease of interest to us. Now look at the right, and I want you to see what the data shows. You see all four of the themes that are part of social vulnerability listed there. But what you see is that each theme was associated with the outcome of exposure to that infectious disease for your first responders differently. That means that of all these communities are vulnerable in different ways, the ways that they can be vulnerable are associated differently with the outcomes you're looking at. So in this particular case, if we look at racial and ethnic minority language, that category again, we see that for one unit and increase of that particular theme of vulnerability, there was an increase in the odds that the first responder would get exposed to the infectious disease of interest by almost 95%. Do you think for a moment about uh, how knowing that can help you design effective community partnerships? Think about who are the right groups in your communities to partner with, whether they be your public health department, your faith leaders, your sports teams, your public education organizations, your institutions of higher learning. Think about how having this information can help you design tailored interventions around parameters of interest for you. In this case, we were interested in that particular infectious disease. Notice how you could prioritize and target things based on the theme that's most associated with your outcome. So why does this matter? How can you use this more broadly than what I described today? I want you to think about being able to pair the social vulnerability indices data set for your communities with many other data sets. I want you to be thinking about information about the number of fires, the types of ignition sources, anything you could imagine, pairing these data sets and asking yourself what aspect of vulnerable communities is associated with the outcomes I'm seeing. Think about being able to make evidence-based requests for resources and allocations. Think about going to the partners within your community and again having evidence-based information to reach out to them and say, we need to work with members of your community. We're finding these challenges. We'd like your support and help to address this issue. Maybe in this issue it's housing maybe in another thing it's transportation, maybe it's language. You can identify who to work with to affect change. 
Think about being able to improve emergency preparedness planning by knowing what aspects of community vulnerability are driving the outcomes you're seeing. When it comes to some fire prevention examples, think about how this sort of an approach will influence things like smoke detector distribution programs. Think about how it might influence your messaging, education, or intervention strategies around getting sprinkler systems installed in new construction in some communities, or during major building renovations, getting them to be put into those buildings or dwellings. Think about the education, communication, and coordination you might achieve when you're trying to minimize and reduce hoarding. These are all things you can do using this methodology. We just simply demonstrate it using that infectious disease. Coming back to that, what could we do with that from a PPE perspective? Well, if we ever have a PPE shortage again, we could look specifically at that data and identify what stations in your department have first responders most at risk for being exposed to infectious disease. And if you have shortage issues, you can prioritize based on the community they're responding to and this sort of data. Could also proactively work with those communities to be distributing intervention mechanisms such as respirators or face masks with educational materials instructing those individuals what to do, how to behave, and what to use those interventions for to reduce the risk of transmission. I want to come all the way back to earlier this morning, and for those of you that weren't there, Dr. Moore Merle introduced when we started this panel that the sixth ask that we need is to be thinking about standards. I want you to think for a moment that in order for us to do this study across multiple fire departments, we needed to make sure we worked with them so they were using a standardized data set. That's because there is no national standard for this data right now. In order for your state partners and your federal partners to look at nationwide data around community vulnerability and be able to offer support, facilitation, collaboration, and funding, we've got to be looking towards standardizing this data so that we can take that step forward and understand what's needed for all of these outcomes that are affecting your experience and exposing you to risks. Thank you. I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Steve Kerber. Thank you very much, and it's a privilege to be able to join you this afternoon to talk about the risks that we face in the changing built environment. During a fire today, you have the least amount of time to safely exit your home than at any time in history. Please let that sink in for a second. With all the technological advancements, increased knowledge in fire safety and the hazards we face, in 2022, this is our current reality. I'd like to share a couple statistics that show we have much work to do and progress to make. The deaths per 1,000 home fires has increased by 20% since 1980. This means that the severity of one in two family homes and fires in these homes has increased in the last 40 years. Your chance of dying in a fire today is higher than it was 40 years ago. Homes where our residents should feel the safest, unfortunately, that's not the case when it comes to fire safety. Our second statistic is also troubling. From 2012 through 2019, we've experienced a 30% increase in fire deaths in the United States. Another proof point that we've got a trend that we have to work hard to turn around. Now, there's not a simple factor here. There's not one thing we can point to as to why fires are more deadly today. It's really a complex system that we know a lot about. Much has changed over the decades. Homes are larger, on average, by 1,000 square feet larger than they were since 1980. 
which means more complex escape plans and harder homes to get out of. We've incorporated more open spaces into our homes, which allows for easier fire and smoke spread. The fuels or furnishings in our homes have evolved to incorporate more synthetics or plastics. These plastics burn faster and release more toxic smoke than the natural fuels they've replaced. The building materials we build our homes out of have changed for several reasons. A lot of those reasons really important, such as reduced cost, material availability, energy efficiency, have all come to play a role. We've also incorporated many new technologies in our homes, which can be looked at as new ignition sources when you're a fire protection engineer. That's how we tend to, to look at things, such as lithium ion battery powered devices. Each of these changes can be significant and they can come together to lead to significant fire safety challenges. Today, we're seeing faster fire propagation, shorter times to flash over or the amount of time it takes for a room to completely be involved in fire, rapid changes in fire, shorter escape times for occupants, shorter times to collapse, which is an incredibly important factor for the fire service that's responding to deal with all of these new and unknown hazards. I'd like to show an example of how changes in furnishings can impact our fire safety. Look at this comparison. We ignite a small flaming fire in the sofa of each room. Each room is furnished with identical furnishings in type, but not in composition. On the natural room, we've got a sofa filled with cotton and wood furnishings that are actually made of wood. On the right, on the synthetic, we've got a room that represents predominantly what we have in our homes across the United States. Foam-filled sofas and other furnishings and accessories that are made of plastic. Notice the difference in smoke as the fire grows, the thick black smoke in the synthetic room, a sign of incomplete combustion with serious toxic consequences. Temperatures over 1,000 degrees and a couple breaths of over 10,000 parts per million of carbon monoxide will leave our occupants unconscious. Counter that to our natural room that is burning more completely, yet much more slowly. That room does go to flashover, but ultimately it takes in excess of 30 minutes to get there. So when I talked to my grandfather in the past about response times and what he could do during his fires, what we can do today during fires, it's a very different work environment and a very different environment that the public has to escape. Here, we have an example of the technological advancements that we have that have created new hazards in our living environment. The simple hoverboard demonstration right here is able to show you that battery technologies make many things possible, but when a lot of energy is stored in a small space, there's the potential for fire hazards like this. Notice, as we light our lab on fire, with the projectiles coming off of the hoverboard here, how you can have this object in a living space that can easily ignite other fuels that may be in the vicinity, allowing not just the fire from the source, but also the fire that can spread to many other objects and quickly consume our homes. There's many layers of fire safety that we can use to address the challenges that we discussed starting with educating the public and preventing fires from happening in the first place. But as Chief Lee pointed out, fires are gonna happen, accidents are gonna occur. So when this fails, we have to limit the size of the fire by reducing the content flammability and interior finishes of what can catch fire. Content like the furnishings we just saw in the video. When that does not limit the fire, we need good detection and alarm so that people have a maximum amount of safe time to exit the structure. Our research shows this is often three minutes or less. Detecting does not limit the size of the fire. We need active suppression for that. 
Sprinklers are our best active suppression technology, and we know they work to save lives and limit property damage. Unfortunately, these are not incorporated in most places. Then we ultimately get around to protecting and keeping the fire small with resistance or turning to manual suppression by the fire department. And while they do a great job to put out fires, they're behind the eight ball because of the timeline we're talking about. When you've got a room that can go to flashover in three minutes and an average response time of six minutes or more, you can see how things are not stacked in our favor. I spoke a lot about homes, but the evolutions in our built environment are not limited to homes and it's continually happening all around us. How we build in the wildland urban interface and suburban communities is susceptible to conflagrations like we haven't seen in decades. Expanded use of lithium ion batteries go beyond hoverboards to mobility devices, to energy storage systems, to electric vehicles. We're seeing an expansion of large warehouses to support our shipping needs and construction practices such as plastic blocks, tall wood buildings, combustible facades, and the list goes on and on. There's not a desire to stop these evolutions, but to make sure that safety is balanced as they're incorporated into our society. As part of the Presidential Commission 75 years ago, President Truman shared this. The serious losses in life and property resulting annually from fires cause me deep concern. I am sure that such unnecessary waste can be reduced. The substantial progress made in the science of fire prevention and fire protection in this country during the past 40 years convinces me that the means are available for limiting this unnecessary destruction. These same words could be spoken today, just as relevant, and the challenges are different, but we do have the means, and we still have the means, to get ahead of these problems and to address these problems. With many evolving challenges, we've learned a lot, and it's able to give us a path forward. Fire is fast. Manual suppression is often behind the spread of fire. We know that automatic suppression in the form of sprinklers is not behind the speed of fire. We know people don't think a fire will happen to them, which leads to complacency and indifference. We need to leverage tactics to get people to the right information in a way that they want to consume that information. We know escape plans, smoke alarms, and closed doors save lives. We also know that our environment and society are going to continue to evolve, creating new fire safety challenges. It's inevitable, but we can't let them continue to outpace, outpace safety if we're going to create safe living and working environments in our communities across this country. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome our next panelist, Chief Shane Ray. A fire safe America is possible. I hope we all support what our great U.S. Fire Administrator and our president is doing today and that bringing us all of us stakeholders to the table to fight the issues that plague the public business industry and the environment today. All of this will make a difference tomorrow and for years to come. We all know that we can bring safe and affordable housing. We can ensure all buildings are safe, functional for the occupants who visit, the workers who work there, and the firefighters who may have to respond to them. The solution exists today with smoke alarms, fire sprinklers, and firefighters. This combination of early warning, early suppression, and emergency response can be for fire what seat belts, airbags, and paramedics are to the auto accident. In 1947, President Harry S. Truman appointed a general to convene the President's Conference on Fire Prevention. This was a driving reason for many changes in this country. The next major report on the state of fire in America was not until 1973. 
When the Commission on Fire Prevention and Control, commissioned by President Richard Nixon, this created what we know today as America burning. President Truman, in his 1947 speech, called fire a menace to society. He was witnessing fires of great death and destruction during these times. These fires included the Gulf Hotel Fire in Texas in 1943, the LaSalle Hotel Fire in Chicago in 1946, two weeks later the Canfield Hotel Fire in Dubuque, Iowa, followed by the Weinkauf Hotel Fire in Atlanta, Georgia six months later. You also had fires in places where people assemble, such as the Rhythm Club Fire in Nancys, Mississippi in 1940, and then the Coconut Grove Fire in 1942. These were just a few fires that claimed a significant number of lives. We changed codes and standards, but we still did not go far enough. These tragedies would be repeated again, such as the Beverly Hills Supper Club in 1977, the Happy Land Social Club fire in 1990, and the Station Nightclub fire in 2003. And those fires are possible as we sit here today. This level of death and destruction has been minimized thanks to the professionalism of our fire departments, the equipment that we now have, which the NFPA standards have impacted the most. I also share that we estimate there's been a 70% increase in the number of buildings protected with automatic fire sprinklers since the 1980s, which is when the National Fire Sprinkler Association began tracking the shipments of fire sprinklers in North America. I understand as a fire chief and as the state fire marshal that there's a changing environment and that I had a responsibility for the built environment of my community and our state. Because fire is a waste. You heard President Truman call it that. A waste of property, a waste of jobs, tax base, insurance money, and worst of all, lives of the citizens and firefighters. Thanks to the National Fire Academy, uh, Executive Fire Officer Program and the Assistance to Firefighters Grant Program, I learned during a research project in 2003 that the fire problem was getting worse. My simple mind told me that because we were building over a million homes a year then, and we've been doing that now for nearly a decade again, that the problem had to be worse. Couple that with today with unregulated products hitting the market, the volume of material in our homes, and the flammability of the contents within our home, it is obvious that the U.S. Fire Administration data says fire deaths are 24 percent up. The best firefighters and fire protection systems in the world are being challenged. Both the combination of firefighters and fire sprinklers are working all they can do to, to cover this configuration. But it is not new. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, we worried about entire towns burning down. And even the best codes and the best firefighting forces we thought possible then still were struggling to keep up. Well, thanks again to our great firefighters, we have seen a decrease in minimization of this, but I tell you the fire problem in America is getting worse by the day because local and state governments are not adopting the latest codes and standards available to them. Also, the federal government is not leveraging the funding that is being utilized, especially regarding one and two family dwellings. The severity of these fires are greater than ever, and according to the best scientists in the world, fires six times faster than it was 30 years ago. However, as I stand here before you, the states of California and Maryland, along with the District of Columbia, are the only places that are adopting versions of the building and fire and residential codes where the requirements for automatic sprinklers are held intact and remain in the code. As a matter of fact, special interest groups have convinced over half of the states in the country to pass laws that prohibit, prohibit the adoption or modification of any version of the building or fire code that requires automatic fire sprinklers. The action of the past decade to weaken the model codes and standards through the adoption process will cost us lives now and decades from now. We now have over 3,000 people a year dying from fire. And when I say some of those numbers, 
people say, well, that's not too many, 3,000. Well, we have to have smoke alarms, fire sprinklers, and firefighters to reduce this number, but it's going to continue to rise because of the built environment. We must have all three in order not to die in this built environment. Smoke alarms are early warning. Get out, stay out, close the door, plan your escape, no two ways out, close before you can doze. And if you can't three, see through smoke as the public, you probably shouldn't go and go to your second way out. This is the fire sprinklers or early suppression. It is the fastest way to get water on the fire. This keeps the fire small, contains it to the room of origin, gives firefighters a fighting chance to make a save and a grab. And by the way, fire sprinklers, they do not all go off, only the ones closest to the fire. Thus our motto, fire sprinklers buy time, time buys life. As the United States Fire Administration has so well stated, and as Truman said, fire's everyone's fight. But when all our education efforts fail, we must have engineered solutions that are well maintained and enforced. We believe the number of fire deaths annually prior to 47 would have been over 20,000 per year. In 1947, that conference said the numbers were over 12,500. We know that by 1973 in America burning, it said 12,000 per year. Well, if you use U.S. Fire Administration data today and NFPA data, I believe that from 2010 until today, 35,140 people have died in fires from 2010 till today. We know that only 65 have died in buildings protected with automatic fire sprinklers. And that is what we must do to play a significant role in reducing fire deaths and waste in this country. Many opponents say fire sprinklers cost too much, aren't effective, and smoke alarms are enough. Well, those same opponents said that in the 1970s and 80s about smoke alarms, that they were, were not cost effective. But we know that fire sprinklers have a 120-year record of being 96% plus effective. I feel comfortable in saying this. I've never been to a fire in all my career in the fire service or the fire protection industry where a civilian or firefighter has died in a building built to the latest code, maintained to that code, and covered by a fire department that was adequately staffed and trained. And this world is a world that we all seek, and I know we can imagine it for sure. As our world changes, we must invest more in science and technology to prevent and mitigate the impact of fire on our lives and our world. Finally, we need something that I'm not aware we've ever had, and that is we need support and investment from companies that cause an impact of these fires to our firefighters and to our citizens. We live in a society that can keep our families, our neighbors, and our friends from dying in fires. Why don't we do it? We have to commit. My want, need, and desire and prayer that this summit is a start to bring in the stakeholders who are responsible uh, for this and creating and dealing with the fire problem in, Mer in America to this table annually. I hope that we can do this. This group should have the goal of eliminating the menace and stopping fire waste in America. I love the American Fire Service. Stay safe, stay well, and God bless you. I would now like to call Lorraine Carley to, the, to introduce the next panel with NFPA. Thank you, Lorraine. Good afternoon. My name is Lorraine Carley, and I'm the Vice President of Outreach and Advocacy for the National Fire Protection Association. We are honored to be the premier sponsor of the State of the Science of the U.S. Fire Administrators Summit on Fire Prevention and Control. I'll be introducing our next panel, and we will continue until Dr. Moore Merrill returns to the podium to introduce our special guest. 
Our next panel will discuss the devastating effect the increase in wildfires is having on the public and specifically the fire service. Wildfires know no bounds. They impact rural, suburban, and urban communities, causing great risk to civilians and threatening to destroy entire neighborhoods. As a result of the catastrophic scope and intensity of these fires, many firefighters whose primary training is structural firefighting may now be operating in an urban conflagration for which they may lack experience, training, and equipment. It is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel to share more on this topic. Carl Fippinger is Vice President of Fire and Disaster Mitigation for the International Code Council. He is a 30-year veteran of the Fire and Emergency Services, having served as Assistant Chief with the Ocklawan Woodbridge Lawton Volunteer Fire Department in Prince William County, Virginia. Carl is a certified emergency manager with over 25 years experience at the federal, state, and local disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. Michelle Steinberg is the Wildfire Division Director at the National Fire Protection Association. Since 2002, she has guided the development and growth of the FireWise USA Recognition Program, the National Wildfire Community Preparedness Day Program, and Outthink Wildfire, a policy initiative to end the destruction of communities by wildfire. She also serves as the volunteer board of directors of the International Association of Wildland Fire and on the Presidential Wildland Fire Mitigation and Management Commission. Spending the last seven years as Director of Operational Services at IAFF, Rick Swan is responsible for providing field education and training within the fire service so firefighters can better understand and manage their health and safety. He has been a member of several NFPA and ISO standards committees for over 20 years and chairs the NFPA Correlating Committee for Fire and Emergency Services Protective Clothing Equipment. Rick spent 33 years at CAL FIRE, retiring as Deputy Chief in San Luis Obispo, and has almost 40 years of service as a union leader for IAFF and CAL FIRE Local 2881. I now like to ask Carl to come to the podium. Good afternoon and thank you for coming and thank you to those who are watching. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So we're here to speak with you today about wildfire. Let's start with what you see on the right, the Wildland Urban Interface, or the WUI. The United States Fire Administration defines the WUI as the zone of transition between unoccupied land and human development. It's the lined area or zone where structures and other human development meet or intermingle with undeveloped wildland or vegetative fuels. With that said, let's talk for a minute about the Wildland Urban Interface and how it's grown in the United States. This is what we know from the 2010 census. In fact, we're still working on the 2020 numbers, but we know that the WUI continues to grow exponentially. The gold dots that you see on the map represent growth in WUI areas, and maybe not in places where maybe you would think that you'd see that. Over the 10-year period from 1990 to 2010, the wildland urban interface grew by 33% to over 190 million acres. The number of homes in the wildland expanded by more than 41%. The WUI continues to grow by approximately 2 million 
acres per year. If we do the math, we're well over 210 million acres in this country today. 99 million people, that represents a third of U.S. population, now live in the wildland urban interface. So we've talked a little bit about wildfire hazard. Let's shift to risk. The legend that you see in the bottom right, it represents in the dark green very low risk. The lighter green represents low, yellow equals medium, orange is high, and the red is very high wildfire risk. Just how many of our communities are at risk from wildfire? Over 46 million residences are at risk. Greater than 70,000 communities in this country at risk from wildfire. Imagine seeing this out your back window. But for many communities in the U.S., it's a reality today. Let's talk about how our risk translates in the real world. Property intelligence firm CoreLogic in its 2022 wildfire risk report says that wildfire activity is becoming more extreme and destructive with more record-breaking fire events in terms of numbers of structures and lost and acres burned in a single event. Headwaters Economics, a nonprofit research organization, states that from the beginning of 2005 through the middle of this year in June of 2022, more than 97,000 structures were destroyed. And the National Interagency Fire Center reports for the year 2021, more than 59,000 wildfires in this country. 7.13 million acres burned, almost 6,000 structures destroyed in the built environment. More than 3,500 of them being residences. Let's shift gears into model codes and standards. They're used to construct safe, sustainable, affordable, and resilient buildings in communities worldwide. Here's a look at how we're doing in the United States relative to hazard resistant building codes. You'll see in the legend, the white represents areas that we have no building code data, it's unreported. The yellow, well, that represents old or weakened international building code and international residential code, or even no code adopted. The green, that's a different story. Modern building codes make a difference. That represents the 2018 or later modern additions of the international building code and the international residential code. But the takeaway here, According to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, only 25% of hazard-prone jurisdictions in this country adopt the latest two editions of hazard-resistant building codes. We've got to do better. Here you see an incipient wildfire. This research experiment took place at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety or IBHS at their lab in South Carolina. This incipient wildfire generates embers and IBHS simulated a large ember driven wildfire. On the left, you see non-fire resistant construction, flammable vegetation too close to the home, wood shake shingles, single pane windows, exposed eaves and soffits, and common attic vents. On the right, a different story Fire-resistant construction, landscaping, and front door, fire, fiber cement, exterior siding, double-pane windows, fire-resistant building materials covering the eaves and the soffits, and fire-resistant attic vents. What a difference. It's amazing. Modern building codes and standards promote several key concepts 
for regulating the built environment. For wildfire, we talk about three different locations. It's a system at the parcel level. Then we move to the neighborhood level once the homes are all together and protected. And then we move to the community level. We create a systematic defense. For wildfire, those key concepts are ignition-resistant construction, removing those vegetative fuels, creating defensible space for the fire service to protect the home, providing adequate emergency vehicle access and water supply, and as Chief Ray talked about, fire sprinklers. They help to make the fires that start inside the home make sure that they are controlled and make sure that the fire does not get out of the home. As an example, I'll show you the International Wildland Urban Interface Code. It's a model code that helps communities safeguard the built environment. Out of 50 states, only five states adopt the IWUIC. Of more than 3,100 counties across 24 states, only 94 adopt the IWUIC. Along with new federal buildings, over 5,000 square feet built on federal land since 2016. The simple fact is that we're in the midst of a national housing crisis. There simply aren't enough homes for everyone that are trying to live here. And we've got to do better when it comes to both protecting the homes that we have and those that we're going to build. Finally, you ask, where's the proof? Do modern building codes really make a difference? How do we create safer and more wildfire resistant communities and resilient communities? What you're looking at is the burned out living room of a home that burned during the campfire in 2018 in California. The home next door that you see through that living room, it stood likely because it had a lot going for it. Fire resistant siding, double pane windows, fire resistant materials covering the eaves and the soffits fire-resistant attic vents. A McClatchy analysis of the 2018 campfire concluded that a 2008 building code designed for California's fire-prone regions, requiring fire-resistant roof siding and other safeguards, protected more than 100 homes in the path of the campfire. 51% of the 350 single-family homes built after 2008 were undamaged. By contrast, only 18% of the more than 12,000 homes built prior to 2008 escaped damage. So I'll leave you with this. More than half of the 350 single-family homes built after 2008 in the path of the campfire were undamaged. Modern building codes tell a great story, and they work. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Steinberg with the National Fire Protection Association. And I'd like to tell you that we've got a wicked problem on our hands. Weather patterns have shifted in location, intensity, and duration. Globally, we are experiencing and will continue to experience extreme weather events, higher highs and lower lows. For the fire service coping with wildfires that threaten our communities, it means that the fires you fought at the beginning of your career are not the same as the fires you're fighting now. And for you new recruits, the fire experience in 20 or 30 years' time will likely be very different than what you are dealing with today. We won't be able to look to the past to tell us how to cope with future scenarios. So how is a volatile climate impacting the fire service and wildfires? Basically, Extremes mean severe droughts and longer periods of hot weather, alternating with bouts of heavy precipitation that contribute to the growth of vegetation that fuels the fire. When we go from an overabundance of rain fueling growth of vegetation to severe drought and extreme high temperatures, we're presented with dead and dry vegetation that contributes to wildfire's intensity and spread. 
we are likely dealing with water shortages that impact our number one tool in fire suppression, and we may see more fires that reach deadly intensities faster, putting the lives of residents and responders at higher risk. These impacts, along with the decisions our society has made about how to use and manage landscapes, have created today's wildfire disaster potential. But what is key is that we have to tackle the things we can impact. We can't control the weather, the oxygen, and the heat in the fire triangle, but we can control the fuel. And when it comes to the problem of wildfire disasters, that is, dozens, hundreds, or thousands of structures burning simultaneously, fuel is not just the plants and the trees. It is our homes and businesses, but mostly our homes. When it comes to structures as fuel for wildfires, it is mainly our homes, and a recent analysis of HUD and Census data shows that 94% of existing building stock in the United States are residential structures. 90% of that stock, 100 million structures, are single-family homes. And by some estimates, as Carl just mentioned, something like 45 or 46 million of them, almost half, are located in areas where wildfires happen. Of those 46 million homes, a tiny fraction of a percent have been sited, designed, and built using some kind of standard or code addressing the wildfire risk. A recent housing survey indicates that the vast majority of American homes in wildfire risk areas have vegetation surrounding their homes, many with vegetation up close to the home, like you see here, within five feet of the exterior walls. Building material science and fire science research on how homes ignite are key to our understanding of how we can prevent the urban conflagrations we are seeing so frequently when wildfires occur. Once the embers and flames of wildfire make their way into gutters, onto decks, and into the plantings around our homes, it is almost always too late to stop the chain reaction of structure-to-structure -structure ignition. CAL FIRE's analysis of eight major wildfire disasters in California since 2014 shows that 93% of all structures within those fires' perimeters were completely destroyed. In those eight fires, between 68% to 99% of all that destruction occurred within 24 hours of the fire starting. This represents more than 38,000 buildings, mostly homes. This means that fire, fighting wildfire disasters has to start long before there is smoke in the air. The data is telling us that urban conflagrations cannot be stopped with the suppression and response tactics we rely on in other kinds of fire events. There is just too much fuel in the form of combustible buildings for our firefighters to be effective in saving property once those structures ignite. Furthermore, NFPA has gathered data directly from the U U.S. Municipal Fire Service, who tell us that most of their departments do indeed respond to wildfires that impact structures, but that many of those responding do not have the adequate training nor the personal protective equipment suitable for these kinds of fires. Most departments are very limited on how many exposed structures they can handle alone and must rely heavily on mutual aid, often up to the state level. Wildfire disasters are occurring not just because of climate impacts, but also because of how we are choosing to use land. In many forested landscapes, we have decades or even a century of overgrowth, partly due to suppressing wildfires that would otherwise serve a natural and beneficial function of clearing out certain species and enhancing habitats for others. In many areas where we have chosen to develop and build our residential communities, we've ignored the presence of wildfire in the natural environment. And just like floods along riverbanks, wildfires have a natural function and a return interval. Where wildfire has been, it will occur again. And when we build without fire in mind, it can result not only in environmental degradation and the disturbance of ecological patterns, but also in whole neighborhoods where every structure is highly vulnerable to ignition. This is another element we can and must control. Fortunately, 
The post-fire analyses, experiments, and scientific models examining this structure vulnerability provide us with clear direction on what we can do to bend down the risk of home ignition and wildfire disaster. While it is much easier to put these concepts into play in new construction, we can mitigate the risk to existing properties. Fire-resistant building materials, design, and construction can address that exterior fire exposure and thwart the entry of embers into buildings' interiors. These actions can also be taken to upgrade or retrofit existing homes. Thoughtful landscape design can minimize the type and amount of combustible plantings and material, especially very near structures, and create areas that break up the fuel for surface fires. Finally, we must use social science research to help us motivate community-wide efforts to mitigate that wildfire risk to homes. If only a few people mitigate their homes, they're still vulnerable if their neighbor's home or outbuilding ignite. NFPA and many government and nonprofit organizations have been promoting these actions for years and must continue to engage and activate the public to take these safety steps. Ending wildfire disasters will take not only better training and equipment for our fire service, but a major paradigm shift. We cannot hope to avoid continued massive property loss if suppression and response are our only tools. We must work to apply the hard-won knowledge of how homes burn in wildfires in order to upgrade existing homes, prepare communities, and change how we build new homes and subdivisions. In our planning and development decisions, we must involve the fire service to inform safe design that will limit conflagrations and provide the best possible infrastructure for safe and effective fire response. Thank you. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Rick Swan. Good afternoon and welcome. And uh, thank you for the, uh, the opportunity and the participation here, uh, Dr. Moore, for really appreciate this, this opportunity. And now I want to spend a few moments talking about training. And um, when you're trying to prepare your city, county, state structural firefighters for the urban interface event, which will happen sooner or later, and to build a trained pool of firefighters to safely operate in the urban interface environment that can also assist your local neighbors with help. So let's talk a second about numbers. Um, it's pretty simple. There's only about 25,000 wild, strictly wildland firefighters in the, in the United States. That's it. In California alone, there are over 35,000 professional firefighters. See where we're going here? The IFF has over 330,000 members. There are over 1.1 million professional and volunteer firefighters in the United States. So let's focus a second here on a small, fast-moving fire that can generally overtax our local, our local fire departments on a daily basis. This fire happened in Dallas, Texas, a suburb of Dallas, Texas, of Balch Springs. It was just off of Highway 20 near the South Beltline Road. Pretty small, 10 acres. Unfortunately, it destroyed nine homes and damaging another 17. As the fire intensity grows, we add resources. And this was a Laguna de Gale fire in California, 200 acres. It destroyed 20 homes and damaged 11. And as the fire grows with intensity and turns into a conflagration, we add more resources. This is the Marshall, Colorado fire, 6,026 acres, 1,084 homes destroyed, two deaths. Almost every single one of the firefighters on this fire was a structural firefighter. So as we've heard, we know that there are issues with training with, with our structural firefighters. And reminding you from the photos you just saw, they're going to be facing these events more often and with more intensity. 
The National Fire Protection Association performs a, a, a needs assessment every five years. We've talked about a little bit about this, but we need to go into a little bit more depth on, on what we're talking about here and the long-term issue that we've faced. The needs assessment is a survey of fire departments, large and small, from all parts of the United States. It asks questions covering the areas like staffing, firefighter health and safety, personal protective equipment, training, and urban and wildland interface. Unfortunately, the past needs assessment in 2015 tells the same story as the recently published 2021 edition, namely, we still have not addressed the vital need of training for our firefighters in the urban interface. The goal of the needs assessment survey is to identify the major needs of the fire service by comparing what departments have with that of the existing consensus standards, government regulations, and other nationally recognized guidance documents and, and uh, as, they, uh, as the documents say they need, to have a safe and effective um, response. But we do not connect the dots. We do not address the very basic needs to allow our firefighters to respond to urban interface fires safely and effectively. Recognizing the fact, in 2016, the IFF, with the assistance of a grant from the, from the FEMA grant brought together uh, subject matter experts of uh, urban interface firefighting response from all over the United States and Canada to find out why structural firefighters are facing these statistics and how can we address them. The National Wildfire Coordinating Group class of S215, the Wildland Urban Interface class, is designed for wildland firefighters and it's designed for the wildland firefighter schedule. It's a four-day class. Um, the S215 has been offered for many, many years and is a great program, and it is designed for a specific audience. Responding to the interface is designed with the heart of S215, but we built, uh, to, built it to fit the local city structural firefighter schedule. Wildland firefighters typically work a non-fire on a non-fire workday, an eight-hour day, while structural firefighters work a 24-hour shift. Fire departments can't afford to send their structural firefighters away for four days to get this training. This responding to the interface class offers 10 hours of online training, eight hours of classroom, eight hours of field training that can be broken up into four four-hour modules, and we come to the community. Responding to the interface uses the local fire department's equipment, no special wildland hose, no special tools, no special fire engines, everyday use that they have. Every responding fire engine that they use that day, we're gonna use their equipment. We show them how to utilize the urban interface strategies and tactics, and we use that jurisdiction's target hazards. Using the responding to the interface train the trainer program, the city of Austin, Texas, which ranks fifth in the US for urban interface fire risk, has been one of the first cities to take full advantage of the training. And working with the media and local fire safe councils, they're able to show how preparedness and response works hand in hand. But more importantly, there are about 1,200 firefighters in the city of Austin, Texas. That city has dedicated to train all of their firefighters to this level. And during this last year, and the events, the fire events that occurred in Austin, Texas, they've already seen a difference in how these fires and first arriving um, companies develop the skills and strategies to safely and effectively deal with these urban interface fires. Again, Wildland firefighters from the, from, uh, and our Western local firefighters are consistently facing long deployments away from homes, causing behavioral health issues. These fires are becoming more prevalent, and our local firefighters must have the basic skills they need to safely operate in the urban interface environment and successfully defend homes while 
uh, suppressing interface fires. We believe that the solution in, in, to fill this gap is in the delivery of the material, focusing on the delivery of the material and how it is delivered to structural firefighters. We also think that the greater resource pool can, uh, uh, we can start to reduce the amount of time that our firefighters are deployed and to, and to bring on fresh firefighters uh, that can cycle, cycle through when needed in order to assist with the, the growing behavioral health issues that, that um, bring on from these long deployments. We think that there's a gap. We know we've heard that there's a gap. We think we were able to fill that gap translate between the wildland firefighter and their needs and the structural firefighter and their needs and a training program to fit all those needs. And now I'd like to invite um, Vicki Pritchett to the podium uh, to introduce our next panel. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Vicki Pritchett, and I am the Vice President of Advocacy and Outreach for the National Fire Sprinkler Association. We are proud to be a leading sponsor of the U.S. Fire Administration's Summit on Fire Prevention and Control, along with the National State Fire Marshals Association and UL's Fire Safety Research Institute. We have indeed proven that partnering together is the best way forward as one voice. It is exciting to know that our work today will substantially impact fire and life safety in this nation and the next generation of firefighters. Unfortunately, the number of firefighters serving in communities across the country is steadily declining. This is impacting departments, both large and small, career and volunteer. Fire departments are facing increased call volumes while experiencing new challenges each and every day. At the same time, individuals have increased demands for their personal time, making it harder to commit to the obligations of the fire service. We must invest in programs to incentivize people to join their local fire departments. Americans are some of the most generous and big-hearted people in the world. They want to serve, and it is our job to find ways to support and help them discover how. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our next panel. Chief John Oates is the President and CEO of the International Public Safety Data Institute, the fire service's leader in data and analytics. Before joining the Institute in November of 2021, Chief Oates served as the Chief of the East Hartford, Connecticut Fire Department for 13 years. He has a Bachelor of Science from Franklin Pierce University, a Master of Science from Oklahoma State University, and he is a graduate of the National Fire Academy's Executive Fire Officer Program. Chief John Butler is the Fire Chief for Fairfax County, Virginia. Chief Butler is serving as the first Vice President of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. He is also the chairman of the Board of Visitors right here at the National Fire Academy. Chief Butler holds postgraduate degrees from the University of Baltimore, Johns Hopkins University, and certificates from Harvard University, the National Fire Academy Executive Fire Officer Program, and the Fire Service Executive Development Institute. And finally, Chief Britta Horn is the fire chief for McCoy, Colorado Fire Department. Britta dedicated her life to public service in response to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, when she noticed a need in her local community for emergency responders. Chief Horn created a nonprofit organization fire department with her friends and neighbors in McCoy. Chief Oates. Good afternoon, and it's, it's my distinct pleasure to spend some time with you this afternoon to talk about challenges 
that overlay every single other issue that we talk about today, that all of the efforts relative to science, relative to fire suppression, relative to the built environment, often fail if we don't have firefighters to get on a piece of fire apparatus and roll out the door to address the emergency or to provide community risk reduction, provide local leadership, and all the things that go into the system of fire protection in America today. So with that, this panel is, is, is focused on recruitment and retention, both where are we today and where we need to be in the future. When we look at where we are today, the fire service has been quite frankly fortunate. A lot of departments haven't had to put in much time into recruitment. They just put an ad in the newspaper, put a sign in front of the local volunteer fire station, maybe do a job fair or two, and people come rolling in and go, yes, this is something that I would like to do, whether as an avocation or a vocation. No longer do we see that working. In the career fire service, many departments are seeing record low numbers of applicants for well-paying, well-led, well-trained fire department positions in good organizations. The same holds in the, in the volunteer combination and wildland sphere that the number of people that are showing up to say, yes, I want to dedicate my spare time to this is shrinking. All the while, the service delivery demands for those groups continue to exponentially increase. Part of the research today, as we paint the picture of where the America's Fire Service is today relative to recruitment and retention, is focused on, quite frankly, why do people choose this? Why do they choose it as a line of work? Why do they choose it as a way to contribute to their community? The chart you see on the slide, and I apologize for the small font, is out of the NFPA report on the state of the fire service. And you will look at the age and the time in service, not the age, but the time in service of people in the America's fire service. And a very small percentage, less than 10, has one year or less in the service. And as we go through the chart and look at the top, we have a large number of people that have a number of years of service. Now, when you take that and overlay it over age, you see that those people that have time in our service are also getting up in age. And as the scientists will share with you later this afternoon, that this is not a vocation or avocation or a life's work that favors older people. I'm sorry, that's unfortunately the, the, what we have, but yet that is the state of a lot of our fire departments. So how we recruit, how we get people in the door becomes important. A recent study conducted with the South Carolina Volunteer Fire Service by Dr. Green and Dr. Hendershot has some very important points that can help guide this conversation forward relative to why people come and why people stay. So as we look at improvements in what we do, it says values-driven conversation is often why people come and why people stay the values of the organization aligning with the values of the people coming in the door. And again, that does not matter whether it's career combination, volunteer, or wildland. If the values of, of service, of contribution, of even today, as noted by other speakers, the value of time, which is one of the most precious commodities that we have, is important. So as we align those, the more success we have in aligning those and making training relevant, making calls for service valuable to the community and value to my participation, I am more likely to contribute and want to contribute more. Also suggests that aligning goals of the individuals with the goals of the organization. How often do we ask people, not only as we thank you for being here, but why are you here and why would you like to, to stay, it leads to a better conversation. I'll pause one second there. Thank you, John. Pardon the interruption. I pardon the, pardon the interruption and we're gonna get you right back. But I, um, I have a very special guest with us today. A guest that really needs no introduction, particularly for the leaders in this room and to the fire service at large. 
He is a friend, he's a passionate advocate, and a continuous champion of the men and women on the front lines. No president has ever assumed the nation's highest office with such an affinity and personal connection with us. President Joe Biden was a founding co-chair of the Congressional Fire Service Caucus and served in that capacity continuously until his election as Vice President of the United States, where he continued to advance our issues. Today, for the first time since President Truman in 1947, the President of the United States is participating in the National Summit on Fire Prevention and Control. Please welcome the President of the United States, Joe Biden. Doctor, thank you very, very much. Very gracious of you. I appreciate it. And uh, the U.S. Fire Administration uh, is doing a great job. Look, uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, you all to, for an opportunity to speak at the summit. And it's wonderful to see so many good friends, you know, uh, sitting out there looking at Eddie, Ed Kelly, and uh, I think President Black is there. Uh, Kevin, uh, I, I hope I, I, I can't quite see what I can't see in, in the front there, I think. And um, I, I actually wish I could be there with you in person. You know, I mean it. You know, and I've, I've had to pay respects uh, uh, with you this past weekend on the National Fallen Firefighters Memorial. 30 years ago, God, it seems like 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I was the original co-sponsor with Paul Sarbanes and others of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation Act. And over the years, I've spoken to, at too many, too many funerals for fallen firefighters. From the national events like the Memorial of the Arizona 19 Hot Shots in 2013 to the individuals in my home state that unfortunately are too numerous to name. And each one, each one of you is a hero to the community. Uh, you've touched people's lives. So I, 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 I'd like to take a moment at the top here to honor the lives we've lost of those uh, the past two years, including from COVID, 135 on-duty firefighters in 2021, another 77 to date in 20, 2022. And it's, a, it's an acute reminder of the risk firefighters bear and quite frankly, their bravery. You're the only ones who run toward flames and not away from them when that fire bell rings. And you look, you know, many of you, many of you heard me say before, first God made man, then he made a few firefighters. God made man, then he made a few firefighters. I grew up in Claymont, Delaware, and across, I went to a little school called Holy Rosary Grade School across from the Claymont Fire Hall. And all my buddies, they came, either became a firefighter a cop or a priest. I wasn't qualified for any of them, so here I am. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's truly amazing that an estimated 1,041,200 local and municipal firefighters, 65% of you are volunteers. And I'm proud to say in Delaware, my home state, it's 98.3% of all firefighters are volunteer firefighters. And by the way, I know you're all having trouble keeping because of COVID and because of the, the, uh, the, the schedules people have these days, getting, uh, attracting enough volunteers to man, man all the stations. You're the heart of the community. You know, well, people don't appreciate you until they need you, but then they do and, uh, and you're always there. Firefighters have saved my life and the life of my family. I want to just tell you for a moment, I know a lot of you know from, if anyone from Delaware there knows, you know, uh, way back in 1972, before I got sworn in, my family, my wife was Christmas shopping with my three children and, and uh, a tractor trailer. They got in an accident, broadsided and killed my wife, killed my daughter. And my two boys, who were then almost three and almost four, were on top of their dead sister and mother. And it took the jaws of life for my local fire department, volunteers, to, to get them out and get them to the hospital and they saved their lives. In addition to that, what happened was uh, I, uh, I, was, uh, I, I was doing Meet the Press and uh, lightning struck a little pond behind my house, came up through the ground into the air conditioning system, ended up generating thick black smoke, literally 
literally that of those proportions. And from the basement to the third floor, the attic, everything was ruined. And the kitchen floor, we almost lost a couple firefighters, they tell me, because the kitchen floor was the burning between the beams in, in, in the house, in addition to almost collapsed into the basement. And then, uh, and then I was... Uh, I got rushed to the hospital for a, turned out to be almost a nine hour operation with a cranial aneurysm in the middle of a snowstorm by my fire company. They got me down, they saved my life. And so I owe you and so many other Americans owe you as well, so many families. The only thing that saves lives of a firefighter are more firefighters. The only thing that saves lives of a firefighter are more firefighters. That's why as a senator and as a, when I was out of office and then back as president, we do everything we can to support and pay for firefighters, more firefighters. You know, and you're there for most people who've just lost everything. And by the way, I, again, to add a little second here, I, I, you know, you're also, what people don't realize, you're the same folks who are there holding the boot in the corner to raise money for the people who just lost their home. Not a joke. That's what you do. That's what you do. You're the ones who line the little league fields. You're the one, you're, you're just, anyway, you're an incredible group of individuals. You know, in Delaware, uh, we used to say back when I first started running as a kid, and say there's three parties in Delaware, Democrats, Republicans, and firefighters. And thank God I had the firefighters. I just got off with the president of the Delaware Volunteer Fire Company who said, Joe, do you remember I was in your first campaign in 1972? Anyway. You're on the front lines for emergencies and disasters all across this great nation. From the devastating wildfires in the West to the thousands of fires that local firefighters respond to every day and uh, response to Hurricane Ian in Southwest Florida. And by the way, I point out that I've flown over just this last 18 months, flown over most of the major fires in the West. More timber, more housing has burnt to the ground than all of the land mass in the state of New Jersey. That's how much it has been lost. And, uh, you know, I went down to Florida to seek a response last week. Uh, firefighters helped rescue thousands of survivors. And they answered the call, not just for fires, just answered the call. And in some cases, their own homes and firehouses were damaged, destroyed, or washed away. Because that's who you are. When tragedy strikes, you suit up. And when the impacts of climate change are becoming increasingly evident, we're calling on you more and more and more. Extreme heat and prolonged drought have turned wildfire season into wildfire years. And local firefighters are being called in more to respond to the fires in the wildland urban interface, where we're moving out into the forest areas to develop and it becomes local and federal. So I want you to know that my administration is doing everything we can to make sure you have the resources you need to do your job as safely and effectively and efficiently as possible. You know, we invested $350 billion in the American Rescue Plan to help states and local states and cities keep first responders on the job, including firefighters, on the job when, during COVID-19. Between the American Rescue Plan and my 2023 budget request, we've increased federal firefighting grants by $320 million, which includes money to fund 1,200 more local firefighters in the field, hundreds more emergency response vehicles, and thousands, thousands of sets of turnout gear. A pioneering research on issues from, including like cancer prevention. You know, it's close to my heart. Cancer is a leading killer of firefighters. Toxic substances you've been exposed to as part of your job are almost certainly, certainly connected to those cancer diagnoses, and we're doing, we're going to do something about it. The cancer moonshot is bringing together every part of a government to cut cancer death rates in half and to end cancer as we know it, including by addressing environmental and toxic exposures uh, to prevent cancer. We just passed national legislation national legislation to deal with the burn pits in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, that uh, so many of our soldiers, we finally got a pass so that we can care for their families if they've been lost their lives or care for them, in fact, if, they, uh, if they're going through this. 
We created a special claims unit at the Department of Labor to ensure that there are processing federal firefighters cancer claims quickly. And we're also taking PFAS, the so-called forever chemicals that for years have been in your gear, your equipment and the suppression agents that you depend on to do your job. I'm determined, I'm absolutely determined to make sure you have the gear that protects you without making you or your family sick. And I'm urging Congress to send to my desk the Federal Firefighters Fairness Act. Let me say it again, the Federal Firefighters Fairness Act, which are going to help federal firefighters and their families assess critical worker compensation resources, including making sure that several forms of cancer are presumed to be caused, presumed to be caused by the firefighter's job. And I'm also I'm also proud that last November I signed a law protecting America's First Responders Act, which extends the benefits under the Public Safety Officers Death Benefits Program to the families of firefighters killed in training and made it easier to qualify for permanent disability. The final point, I'm sorry to go on so long, but I feel passionately about this. The final point I'd like to make today is that we're doing everything we can to ease the burden on our firefighters by preventing fires. This is the 100, hard to believe, it's the 100th anniversary of Fire Prevention Week. And the landmark legislation I've signed along includes historic investments to reduce the risk of fire. The bipartisan, the bipartisan infrastructure law includes significant forest management increases community resilience to wildfires, and harnesses new technologies to keep communities safe. It's also repairing vital infrastructure that firefighters and other first responders rely on to quickly get to, the, to the, 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 those in need. By the way, we're talking about the, all the bridges that are in tough shape. I was out in western Pennsylvania. There was a fire station, a bridge over a creek, and a school not far from there. They have to go, I think it was seven miles. If that, they couldn't go across the bridge because it wasn't strong enough to maintain and excuse me, handle the fire truck. You know, the Inflation Reduction Act enables us to take unprecedented steps to confront climate crisis, which is going to protect forest health, reduce fire risk, and supercharge our clean energy future. We're also maximizing protections for people when fires do break out through a national initiative to help states, local, and tribal and territorial governments adapt and adopt the most up-to-date building codes that reflect the threats from, the climate, from climate change. We're using the Department of Defense satellite imagery to detect wildfires in the early stages so firefighters have a better chance to suppress the fires early before they can impact on local communities. And we're working, to help, we're working to help educate the public on basic fire safety, like preparing fire escape plans, testing smoke and carbon monoxide and alarm monthly, and replacing those alarms every 10 years. This is simple steps we can take to save lives. Look, on behalf of my own family and every American, I just want to close this saying again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Fires will always be a fact of human life. And when the worst happens, when those alarms go off, when everything and everybody you love is in danger, there's no better sight in the world than that firefighter who's ready to go to work. So thank you for being who you are. Thank you for all the heroes you represent. You are, you are on the alert and on call in communities all across this country right now as I speak. So God bless you all, and may God protect our firefighters. Thank you for letting me have a chance to talk to you. I wish I, were, I literally do wish I were there with you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I think you now see that this is a historic event. The presence of the President of the United States is significant, and you heard his words. Those in the room and the more than a thousand people we have watching online, this is significant. I'd like to invite the panel back up 
and they will continue when we finish this panel, everyone. We will take a short break before we start our final panel. So if you'll stay with us, this panel will continue and then we'll take a short break. Chief Oates, if you will, please. Thank you, everyone, and forgive the interruption, but I think it was worth it. There's likely no one in the, in the room that's connected with the fire service that hasn't, and again, career volunteer wildland combination that hasn't uttered the, the statement that Commissioner Teal shared earlier, that it's what we do. But when we look at it in the context of the experiences shared by the President of the United States that reflects the impact of what the America's Fire Service does in homes, businesses, highways, wildland, state parks, everywhere that we do a call for service. It is more than just what we do. The challenge for us today is how do we ensure we have enough people present in our fire companies, in our community risk reduction efforts, in our our fire stations, EMS locations across the United States in order to be able to get that done. So we were talking briefly about the, the study in South Carolina, and I'd like to, the, the final point out of the study that I think is important is the necessary, and I'll read it verbatim because it's important, reduce levels of insularity in recruitment networks. If we want to improve recruitment in America's fire service, we need to reduce insularity in recruitment networks. What does that mean? That means in a large part, a lot of us recruit from people we know, from family members, from people we're acquainted with. And if you have a di diverse representation in your organization, that will help you achieve a diverse organization. But if you don't, we have to break down that insularity and engage groups that are underrepresented in our organization, but represented in our community, that have a value to add to our community as we continue to provide service to our communities. When we look forward, once we get those people, we have to ask ourselves the question as we go from, and we came up as a topic, that we're seeing less applicants than ever before. A very large Western city did a study around 2014 because they struggled with diversity and recruitment. And you can see the numbers on the, on the slide. They started out with over 13,000 applicants, which I think any of us in the room would be thrilled to have 13,000 applicants for a fire service position, except for the people c competing for it. When they were done in that testing environment, they had 187 applicants. That's less than 1.4% success rate. And when you look at the cut lines, and why they existed, over half of that candidate pool was restricted from moving forward in that process because they missed the deadline of submitting a piece of paper. Now, there are a lot of reasons that member departments, volunteer organizations, career departments have well-vetted criteria for inclusion and for joining organizations. I completely understand that. Most are performance-based and well-researched but I'm not sure as we struggle with having people come into our service, failing to meet a deadline for a piece of paper that cut almost half their applicant pool is something that we can afford to do anymore. So as we look at how we recruit, how we open the doors to people, how we become inclusive, how we enhance belonging, we also have to look internally at what processes organizations have in order to ensure that once we get people to say, yes, this is what I want to do, that we walk them through becoming members of the organization in a very thoughtful way. It's also important to look at a case study. There's many, EMS is the cornerstone of the America's Fire Service. It's what we do. There are a lot of departments that require an EMS credential. The problem is the pool of candidates coming to us with an EMS credential are not diverse. A 10-year retrospective study of people that are achieving an EMS credential, whether EMT or paramedic, is overwhelmingly not diverse. It's overwhelmingly white and male. There have been improvements in women taking EMT and paramedic classes. There have been improvements in Hispanics and blacks taking EMT curriculum, but not enough, not enough to move the needle. So if you're looking for a diverse recruit pool, and you're requiring an EMS certification, it's not only a diversity issue, it's an equity issue because are we barring people from that opportunity because of something that we can fix? 
the looking forward piece that we that we look for the future of what to do is if we are not getting the candidates that we need, we need to create the candidates that we need. A previous speaker said that's talking about junior colleges and high schools. I would offer to you that we need to start an elementary school and junior high school to set the hook, to plant the seeds, that people across our entire community look at this as a vocation and avocation. They can contribute to their community, contribute to the, to the health and wellness of the people around them in a meaningful way. Once we start to do that, we will see an improvement in, in our diversity and our recruitment and retention efforts across the entire whole of the America's Fire Service. With that, I'd like to pass to Chief John Butler of the Fairfax County Fire Department. Accepting applications is not recruiting. Accepting applications is not recruiting. I want to talk about a department's uh, successes and areas where they weren't very successful in recruiting. Uh, the department I'm most familiar with right now, um, Fairfax County, Virginia. Historically, like many other departments, there was a stricter selection process. We were an elitist organization. We, we the collective fire and rescue service. With that, we, uh, we all often went to the same applicant pool and, and sought uh, candidates from that pool. Now we're focusing on uh, the, the current culture, the current demographics of many communities like, like mine and, and many of you as well. Being very uh, purposeful and intentional on seeking diversity. And oftentimes the, the, the D word diversity is uh, limited to you know, the, some obvious demographics. While the, that's very important and we should be seeking to uh, have a department that represents or looks like and represents the community we serve, we have to be much more uh, intentional and deeper in thought and, and purpose. So now with, with the changing workforce and the changing culture, we have to look at additional opportunities for uh, you know, taking written tests and CPAT uh, evaluations, CPAT exams. Having CPAT at 2 p.m. Monday through Thursday, it's not very inclusive or expansive. Okay. There has to be a much more uh, asymmetric variety of opportunities for those who are teleworking, who are doing other um, um, professions, or their daily activities look different. Historically, uh, we remained engaged, uh, we did not remain engaged with the candidates. We typically would on the front end, but somewhere right after being um, selected or named and given some dates for the, the written test or CPAT, we tend to drop off historically as, a, as, an, as an industry with mentoring and staying engaged with the candidates. Now it's expected that we stay throughout the experience of being selected and through graduation not only to those who accept the job, but those who don't, are we asking why not? And are we seeking, you know, uh, continuing the mentorship even for those who have chosen, you know, to, to not accept the job? We're spending a lot more time on the, on the whole person. And that whole person approach uh, means while they might have, a candidate might have some scratches and dings in their, in their you know, background uh, history, we have to look at them holistically. Not too many of us are perfect candidates. Not, none of us were, were perfect candidates. So looking at the full picture, the full uh, totality of the person's uh, lifestyle and, and how they have um, lived, and the recency and gravity and frequency of some of those infractions that historically we would have um, disqualified candidates for. 
it is never, never, never lowering the standards. It is never lowering the standards because we can't afford to, all right? We're not going to uh, address the, the fire issue in the U.S. without firefighters, highly trained, well-staffed um, departments. I want, I want to talk a little bit about data analytics. Um, this, this is the one I'm really impressed with. I'm impressed with a recruitment team that now seeks the assistance of our data analytics strategic team. I'm fortunate to have a team of uh, analysts and data scientists who work with us to uh, provide help in, in all areas of, uh, of what we do. To hear the recruitment team who are data, in, data informed and data inspired to ask where are we getting the uh, candidates from, where are we not, which communities are we uh, engaging in and which ones we're not, focusing on high school programs and other uh, uh, programs to uh, make sure we're, we're seeking and getting the, uh, the personnel that we're seeking, we're looking for. In the last uh, couple of years from those high school programs, I know we've speak, spoken about apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs, we've been able to get 10 employed working firefighters from those high school programs. Um, increased presence, uh, you know, we focus on recruiting in our own backyard. Many organizations would uh, seek other communities, other states. There are uh, willing and sometimes uninformed of our profession candidates right in our backyard. And evaluating uh, online marketing and recruitment uh, companies. Uh, sometimes we need help uh, in this space. Uh, many of us who wear the uniform did not come on to be recruiters, nor were we trained to be recruiters. And uh, getting uh, subject matter expert help is, is something that should be uh, looked into. I close with a very short personal story. I was waiting in, a, in, a, in the lobby of a government building for another matter when a recruiter walked by and said, are you here to take the test? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm waiting for a friend. And the recruiter said, well, if you're going to be waiting a while, why don't you come upstairs and take the test? For the first time in my life, I considered this profession when the person grading the test said, you passed. I would have never been upstairs if someone didn't stop and say and, and engage me intentionally and purposefully. So thank you. Accepting applications is not recruiting. And my esteemed colleague is next, Chief Britter Horn. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here at the summit. And think it's an honor to be here with you today. The fire service has tremendous strides in developing a safer and more effective equipment and ensuring safer operations. But there's still much more work to do. There needs to be a great deal of work on developing gear without forever chemicals that can absorb into our skin and reduce exposures to carcinogens. There has been and continues to be significant research on fire behavior translating in, into new training so firefighters can operate it more safely in emergency scenes. Fire apparatus design has evolved over the years to protect the personnel who's riding in them. The safety improvements include new technologies on seat design, ensuring their seat belts, installing airbags, and ensuring safety to our firefighters. But without the people in the, to ride the apparatus, take the training, wear the gear, and the, operate the equipment, all this effort is fruitless. We've been hearing about recruitment and retention concerns for years. Many departments have taken innovation approaches in resolving their staffing issues, but thus far, there has been very, very little to no meaning in their efforts. 
In 2007, the United States Fire Administration published a report on retention and recruitment for volunteer fire service. The reports pointed out that the emergency services are most demanding of volunteer activities today. The physical and time demands associated with training, responding to incidents, maintaining facilities, apparatus and equipment, fundraising, administrating a nonprofit corporation are grueling. In today's hectic world, strong leadership is required to make the emergency services the places that will attract volunteers. My goal today is to share with you a formalized apprenticeship program that has potential to transform our fire departments and ultimately improve our ability to protect our communities. Previous recommendations, including the, the use of CERT teams and Citizen Corps to draw more volunteers into the service, but these efforts have fallen short. There was a period in time in history when the fire service did not have difficulty recruiting or keeping members. We are not the only industry in decli dec declining in volunteerism. Due to the part the, in parts of societal changes, volunteer firefighters have families, work, and other obligations that can be difficult to balance with their service as a volunteer firefighter. For volunteer fire service to survive, we need communities and a middle-class America with the ability to give men and women the time to serve as volunteers in their communities. Volunteer departments and the entire fire service must provide a safe and welcoming environment with resources to sort their physical and behavioral health needs. The risks of firefighter face certain impacts a number of people are not interested in volunteering. Imagine trying to recruit members of the public to serve their communities for a position where there's an increase of cancer, cardiac disease, depression, and anxiety. You don't have to imagine it. We're seeing this every day. All of the uh, other insularity recruitment, departments often draw from family and social networks of existing volunteers. This can limit the reach of volunteer efforts. The traditional way to ensure that a steady flow of good recruits was to rely on existing members to have them recruit by word of mouth. Many departments still prefer to have their members search for new members by talking to families and friends, rather than using a formal and comprehensive recruitment system. However, volunteer fire departments can no longer rely on personal contacts or people just stopping by the fire station to volunteer. Don't get me wrong, making it public aware of needing volunteers through media may help, but it does not overcome the obstacles that firefighting is dangerous and may have long-term effects on your physical and mental health. Offering early screening for cancer, behavioral health, and support for incentives for healthy work-life balance must be included in the discussions in return for those serving our community. Researchers find that the fire service motivation to volunteer is different from person to person. The researchers believe that it must be an asset as the means of what we can recruit and retain members from across our communities, that they will have their own personal motivation to volunteer. We need to improve our recruitment pipeline. We believe the answer lies in adopting a formalized apprenticeship program. According to the Department of Labor, registered apprenticeship programs enable employers to develop and train their future workforce while offering career seekers affordable path to secure quality, high paying jobs. Even volunteers that don't seek a career in the fire service, the skills learned through apprenticeship program will be useful when seeking employment in other fields that allow them to continue and serve in their communities to volunteer, like problem solving, control in crisis situations, focus on learning and training, and good time management ha habits. Look into labor's guidance, we find principles that we as fire service also hold in high esteem. Unfortunately, some volunteer departments have come so short staffed, they may accept applications for membership for people less qualified to perform the functions of a firefighter. Careful screening and holding high principles must be at the forefront when selecting people to serve the public safety positions. 
Finding members of the public with qualities that require to serve in areas of public trust adds to the complexities in recruitment and retention. Apprenticeship programs can serve as a means to ensure quality process of recruitment, ensure excellent training, and bring people to the ranks who demonstrate the qualities needed to serve the public. And those qualities include maturity, commitment, team player, consciousness, moral character, more problem solving, and initiative. Apprenticeship programs must be developed, led, and vetted by the industry to ensure volunteers are trained to meet the industry needs and goals. Apprenticeship programs by design incorporate multiple training and educational methods, including on the job, supplemental education, and credentialing. Mentoring is provided to the volunteers, a concept service we can improve on as we lose that institutional knowledge, experience, and skills that can't be fully learned via training. Research into volunteerism in South Carolina noted an important concept. Volunteer firefighters seek more training, not lowered standards. Therefore, the key to improving recruitment and retention isn't lowering the barriers, but to improve the efforts to engage and provide volunteers with a sense of satisfaction from the commitment they make to their communities. This can positively impact the longevity of a volunteer firefighter's length of service. Like all of us, people stay with the community so long as they feel a sense of satisfaction and belonging. To this end, it means maintaining a fire department culture that is open, welcome, and robust. Apprenticeships also build necessary components noted by our two previous presentations. Apprenticeship programs incorporate diversity, which are programs that are designed to reflect the communities in which they operate through strong non-discrimination, anti-harassment, and recruitment practices. The structure of the national industry-led apprenticeship program can also provide valuable, valuable access to data to help us further and define our recruitment efforts. The Department of Labor's robust data capture and modernization can help provide us with the model to improve our ability to understand and adjust our programs to meet the needs of our evolving communities. For the volunteer, volunteer fire service, I dare say even the career service, to survive, the industry and all the stakeholders, including the public, we must serve and provide resources in making firefighters a safe place. Eleanor Roosevelt was profound in her quote, success must include two things, development of the individual to their utmost potential and two, a contribution to their some kind to one's world. In closing, the fire service needs funding to institute a formalized apprenticeship program and put into place a structured pathway to prepare and develop our future workforce to continue the research needed to make firefighting a place where people can serve and it doesn't cost them their lives or their mental health. My friends, the time has changed. The fire service and recruitment and retention process must change with it. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Chief Horn, Chief Butler, Chief Oates. You have opened our eyes, and I think that we all realize from listening to the various aspects that you presented, the importance of recruitment and retention. And as President Biden shared, there is no better service than that of a firefighter. And so for all of those who are tuned in online, I would like to encourage you to just hang out with us for about 15 minutes. We're going to take a break here on campus. So for those of us assembled, we have 15 minutes. Be back here at 345 and we will resume. You will not want to miss the next panels. So if you're out there in online land, thanks for being with us. 15 minute break and we'll see you soon.
want to keep that up, but we do have two more panels that are going to be amazing. And at this time, I would like to introduce the Deputy Fire Administrator, Chief Tanya Hoover, to the stage to introduce our next panel. Again, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the United States Fire Administration here in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Thank you all for staying with us and joining us today, vote both here on stage or in the auditorium and live uh, streaming. So my name is Tanya Hoover, and I'm the, serving as the Deputy Fire Administrator. I have the privilege of introducing our final panel of today's prevention and control. As I watched the presentations this afternoon, I couldn't help but reflect on my own career, especially as the California State Fire Marshal. The issues we discuss today have real life consequences. Many of us in this room and watching virtually know this. Wildfires, drought, codes and standards, making sure we have well-resourced and well-trained firefighters. Addressing these issues is critical to making America fire safe. The topic of our last panel that is the impact on fire on firefighters' health. I've seen so much progress on how the fire service addresses firefighter physical and mental health. Today, there is investment in research. There's an increase in knowledge and awareness. There's an interest in peers helping peers through difficult times. These changes are noticeable and they are making a difference. Each distinguished panelist I'm about to introduce is responsible for making that difference. Dr. Kenny Fent is the head of the National Firefighter Registry, CDC, NIOSH, a congressionally mandated program to monitor cancer outcomes and occupational risk factors among firefighters. You'll learn a little more about that in a moment. He spent 15 years studying firefighters' exposure and health effects. His research findings provide supporting evidence on various control measures to reduce carcinogen exposures in the fire service. Dr. Jeff Burgess is a professor and the director of firefighter health and collaborative research program at the University of Arizona Mellon Eden Zuckerman College of Public Health. He has been conducting research with firefighters for 30 years focusing since 2015 on cancer prevention. He is the co-lead of the National Firefighter Cancer Cohort Study. He previously worked as an emergency physician, medical toxicologist, and occupational physician. Dr. Sari Yankees is the director for the Center of Fire, Rescue, and EMS Health Research at the National Development and Research Institutes. She completed her doctorate in psychology with a health emphasis at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and the American Hearts Association Fellowship on the Epidemiology and Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease. She has served as a principal investigator of several large-scale studies on the health and readiness of the U.S. Fire Service funded by FEMA's AFG grants. Dr. Denise Smith is a professor of health and human physiology sciences and the Tisch Family Distinguished Professor at Skidmore College, where she serves as the director of first responder health and safety laboratory. She is a senior research scientist at the Illinois Fire Service Institute. Dr. Smith is a leading researcher in firefighter cardiovascular health and has published over 100 scientific articles and received multiple national and international awards for her work to promote firefighter health and safety. And finally, Mr. Pat Morrison is the Chief of Field Services for the International Association of Firefighters, overseeing the Division of Health, Safety and Medicine, the Division of Technical Assistance and Information Resources, and the Division of Education, Grants and Human Relations. Pat's expertise is in designing and implementing behavior, health, and safety wellness programs to promote firefighters' overall physical and mental health, address their medical needs, and increase protection from hazardous elements of firefighting. 
Before joining the IAFF, Mr. Morrison was a career firefighter for 21 years with the Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Department in Fairfax, Virginia. And now I'd like to turn the stage over to Dr. Kent. Sir, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm honored to be able to give you an update, tell you a little bit about the National Firefighter Registry, which is a groundbreaking effort to better understand and reduce cancer in the fire service. And then I'll tell you what I mean by the missing piece. So let's start with what we do know. Um, IARC evaluated the occupation of firefighting. IARC is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the World Health Organization. And they evaluated the occupation of firefight firefighting back in 2010. And at that time, classified firefighting as a group 2B possible carcinogen. Just this past summer, IARC reevaluated the occupation of firefighting. And I had the privilege of serving on that working group along with Dr. Jeff Burgess and others. And based on all the research that's been done over the last 10 to 15 years, IARC came up with a new consensus evaluation classifying firefighting as a group one known human carcinogen based on sufficient evidence of two types of cancer mesothelioma and bladder cancer, as well as limited evidence for five other cancers shown on the screen. And they also found five key characteristics of carcinogens that had strong evidence out of 10. And so all of that information, as well as the fact that firefighters are exposed to chemical carcinogens, night shift work, UV radiation, and a number of other hazards, really begins to, to um, provide very compelling evidence that there is an increased risk of cancer for firefighters, at least for some types of cancer. Now that said, there are a lot of questions that remain. And some of these questions include, but are certainly not limited to, what is the cancer risk for volunteer firefighters? So volunteer firefighters make up about 65% of the US fire service. What is the cancer risk for all the subspecialties of the fire service, like wildland firefighters? How does the cancer risk vary for different demographic groups or regionally across the United States? How prevalent are rare forms of cancer? As I mentioned, IARC found seven cancers with sufficient or limited evidence out of the 30 to 40 primary cancers that we study. How does cancer risk change with increasing exposures, including major events? And we hear a lot from firefighters about long lasting responses and natural disasters and how that may impact their cancer risk. What other occupational and non-occupational risk factors contribute to cancer? To what extent do different control interventions and workplace practices actually reduce the risk of cancer? And are there other chronic illnesses that are elevated among firefighters? And to answer these questions, we really need to uh, follow a very large and diverse cohort of firefighters over a long period of time. And that's where the National Firefighter Registry comes into play. So the National Firefighter Registry came about, came about through an act of legislation called the Firefighter Cancer Registry Act of 2018. And our mission is to generate detailed knowledge about cancer in the fire service through a voluntary registry that reflects our nation's diverse firefighters. Our vision is to equip the fire service in public health and medical communities with the information they need to reduce cancer among firefighters. So that's the ultimate goal. Our goal is to enroll 200,000 firefighters over the next few years after we launch, and we should be launching in the next month or two. And our specific aims are to number one, collect self-reported information on workplace and personal characteristics through a secure web portal. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Number two, to obtain records from fire departments or agencies to track trends and patterns of exposure. And then number three, to take all that information and link it with health information databases that already exist, including state cancer registries and the National Death Index to detect both cancers and deaths. 
So what is the missing piece? Cancer is a reportable illness in all 50 states. However, most states do not collect detailed information about occupation. So if a firefighter develops cancer 20 to 30 years down the road, researchers won't know that they were a firefighter, at least in most states. The NFR allows firefighters or anybody to say, hey, I'm a firefighter. I want you to know I'm a firefighter. So uh, in this image on the screen, you have occupational exposures on the left, and on the far right, you have cancer. And to be able to link the two, we need firefighters to enroll in the National Firefighter Registry. So firefighters are literally the missing piece. Enrolling in the NFR will be straightforward when we launch. Firefighters will go to the web portal, nfr.cdc.gov. They will encounter the screen that you see up there on the screen. Uh, they will confirm their eligibility and then click login.gov. And then they'll be able to create an account using multi-factor authentication that most of us are familiar with where you enter an email, password, and then another form of authentication, like a text message sent to your mobile phone. Firefighters will then read and sign a consent form and fill out a user profile, which should only take about five to 10 minutes, and then complete an enrollment questionnaire, which has optional questions on demographics, work history, health history, and lifestyle. And the whole process should take about 30 to 45 minutes. Data security is of utmost priority. As I mentioned, logging into the web portal will require multi-factor authentication. Data will also be uploaded to an encrypted database each time a firefighter clicks save and continue or logs out. And speaking of logging out, if a firefighter gets a call and they log out and they come back later and log back in, they'll be able to pick up where they left off. Lastly, privacy is protected by an assurance of confidentiality, which protects identifiable information from release, even under court order. So who's eligible? The NFR is for all firefighters, active and retired, career and volunteer, structural, wildland, and all the other specialties, and those with or without cancer. This is not a cancer registry, it's an exposure registry and we need all firefighters to register. It's just as important that we have firefighters without cancer who register as those with cancer. NIOSH will be reaching out to select fire departments to solicit participation and request the all important incident records. But if you're a firefighter, you do not have to wait for that to happen. In fact, most firefighters will be able to enroll themselves through the open enrollment route by simply visiting nfr.cdc.gov. Lastly, you need to know what happens after enrollment. The web portal is really just the starting line, and that's how we'll be able to collect self-reported information from firefighters about themselves and about their work as a firefighter. For some firefighters, we'll also be collecting incident records, and all firefighters will have the opportunity to complete follow-up surveys, which are optional. Then we'll be able to take all that information and match to state cancer registries and the National Death Index and start doing the data analyses. And that's when we can really start to put the data to use to answer the questions that remain, these difficult questions like the relationship between exposures and disease outcomes like cancer, the impact of controls, and how cancer risk varies by different demographic groups and job categories. So I hope you can see the tremendous potential that the NFR has to answer the difficult questions that remain and increase our understanding of cancer and hopefully identify solutions to reduce cancer in the fire service. Thank you for your attention. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jeff Burgess.
All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to share with you information about the, oops, one more, the Firefighter Cancer Cohort Study, or FFCCS, which is a research collaboration with the fire service. So the mission of the FFCCS is to conduct community-engaged research with the fire service to prevent cancer. Firefighters are involved in all phases of the research, from generating the research questions to enrolling study participants, collecting samples, analyzing data, and publishing and disseminating the results. Our goal is to enroll 10,000 firefighters to allow us to evaluate risk for both more common and less common cancers and to follow firefighters for up to 30 years given the long latency period between exposure and onset of cancer. As part of our partnership with the fire service, we have an oversight and planning board, including representatives from many fire service organizations uh, and firefighter research champions working on each individual FFCCS project. A critical part of the FFCCS is collecting blood and urine samples, including upon enrollment, after select exposures, and every two years to measure for changes. We also report back the, res the individual's results to the participating firefighters to help them better protect their health. We collect exposure data from firefighters and their departments and integrate the exposure, biomarker, and survey data to provide answers to the fire service questions. Uh, data are protected by a certificate of confidentiality from the National Institutes of Health. So the FFCCS includes all types of firefighters, including career, volunteer, structural, wildland, wildland and urban interface, or WUI, uh, women firefighters, instructors, trainers, and uh, airport firefighters, among others. The major focus of the FFCCS is cancer prevention. We do this through measuring and reducing exposures, evaluating and reducing the toxicity resulting from the exposures, and supporting early detection of cancer when it is more easily treated. Examples of exposures uh, we measure include metabolites of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, in the urine, per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFOS, also known as forever chemicals, in the blood, and flame retardants, to name just a few. Examples of toxicity include DNA damage, epigenetic changes which control gene expression and increase cancer risk, and more recently, anti-mullerian hormone, or AMH, which is a measure of ovarian reserve or fertility in women. Our study goals are also to identify firefighters at higher risk for cancer so that they can be provided more advanced cancer screening. We have already enrolled over 3,000 firefighters from more than 50 fire departments across 26 states with ongoing additional enrollment and follow-up visits. Our funding to date has come predominantly from FEMA, but also from NIOSH, NIH, the IAFF, and individual fire departments. In 2015, we started work with the Tucson Fire Department, which established many of the study protocols and processes that were used when we formally initiated the FFCCS in 2016, bringing in additional fire departments in the framework study. This was followed by multiple additional studies, including the expansion study under the direction of the University of Miami, which evaluated trainers, fire investigators, and additional subgroups, a PFOS study evaluating PFOS exposures uh, and toxicity in structural and airport firefighters, a WUI study directed by NIOSH, studies of women firefighters, evaluation of volunteer firefighters under the direction of Rutgers University, a PACE study, which is looking at the effects of PFOS on COVID-19 in firefighters, uh, and also a study with wildland firefighters. I would now like to share with you some of the FFCCS research outcomes to date and some on the near horizon. First, 
we have shown that everyone on the fire ground, not just the entry teams, but also engineers and paramedics, absorb carcinogens from the fire into their body. Second, these exposures cause epigenetic changes that turn on cancer genes and put firefighters at higher risk of cancer. These study results support the IARC determination of strong mechanistic evidence for epigenetic changes in firefighters leading to increased cancer risk. Third, we have found that both volunteer and career firefighters have higher levels of PFOS in their blood than the general population. And in further studies with career firefighters, that these higher PFOS levels cause epigenetic changes, again putting firefighters at increased risk for cancer. Moving on to prevention and intervention studies, we have shown that putting engineers on air, uh, that is wearing their self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBA, at the fire ground reduces their exposure to carcinogens by around 40%. And entry stream wash down prior to doffing gear combined with clean cab processes and showering as soon as possible after returning to the station reduces their exposure by about a third. We have also shown that the use of skin wipes at the fire scene not only reduces firefighter exposures, but also the toxic effects of these exposures, results which support the IOC determination of strong evidence that activation of cellular receptors increases firefighter cancer risk. Coming soon, we will be completing our studies of PFAS exposure from previous use of Class B aqueous film-forming foam from fire responses and from wearing turnout gear, as well as the toxicity of PFAS exposures in general. We are also starting to analyze the first set of results from our women firefighter study on cancer risk, stress, and reproductive toxicity, as well as exposures and toxicity in wooey and wildland firefighters. In a study recently approved, by the National Cancer Institute, we will be evaluating the potential beneficial effects in firefighters of a broccoli seed extract pill, which has already shown benefit in reducing the formation of toxic metabolites of benzene and aldehydes in smokers. While there are many steps needed beforehand, the goal is to identify an effective treatment that firefighters could take beforehand to limit their toxic effects of a fire response. Next steps include continuing to seek funding to expand FFCCS participation to its full complement of 10,000 firefighters and to continue to follow these firefighters over time. Uh, also to evaluate additional outcomes requested by the fire service, such as reproductive toxicity, to identify additional toxic exposures and mechanisms beyond those we have already identified Continue to continue to establish and strengthen linkages with the National Firefighter Registry, and most importantly, to expand cancer prevention activities, including reducing toxic exposures and reducing the toxicity of those exposures. If you have questions, please contact me or any of the other FFCCS co-leads listed here. And next, on to my colleague, Dr. Sarah Janke. Thank you. When I was asked to present on the current status of research results on women and cancer in the fire service, I have to admit to having a moment of panic as the presentation was going to be very, very short. Unfortunately, the research on the health of women firefighters in general is relatively limited and research specific to cancer is even more so. However, there is good news on the horizon as it is an area that's receiving increasing attention and there's hope ahead. One of the reasons for the lack of research is the extremely low rate of women in the fire service. We know that women make up approximately 13% of law enforcement, 14% of the military, and the Marine Corps where everyone is required to be combat ready, 6%. Estimates within the fire service are as low as 3.5 to 5%, depending on the data set, and even the most optimistic numbers give the rate at around 9%. Some of the reasons for the lack of research in that in, on women firefighters is that it's just difficult to 
collect data on them. Trying to find them in the departments and trying to find them in the communities is a challenge. It's been suggested that given the low rate of women, it might not be necessary to study them. But our research suggests that the lack of empirical evidence about women and the impact of the job may be part of the barriers to bringing women onto the job. Given the issues highlighted on recruitment and retention earlier today, and for the women who are on the job and trying to manage their own health, or starting on the job and trying to manage their own health, now is the time for research on this key population of firefighters. Don't be mistaken, firefighter health research has enjoyed a significant increase in the past decade. Chief Billy Goldfeder has been quoted as saying, we have done more research in the last 10 years on firefighter health than the 100 years before that. In this instance, in particular, it turns out he is right about that. If you search PubMed, where all peer-reviewed medical research is archived, for the word firefighter, you'll find that more than 80% of the results are articles published in the last decade. This increase is primarily due to funding from FEMA focused on firefighter health, wellness, and safety. It was approximately a decade ago that FEMA started funding the topic of firefighter health through the Assistance to Firefighter Grants Program. The Fire Prevention and Safety and Research and Development Program has funded a small but dedicated group of scientists, many on the stage at the moment. Not all of the publications over the past decade have been FEMA funded. However, the research done has identified additional research questions and sparked a flurry of work on the topic. While there's been a significant increase in publications, most over the past decade have focused on the most available study participants, white male career firefighters. This is obviously an important demographic to study and to understand. However, now that we have a wealth of knowledge about this group, it is important to expand the work to women and other minorities in the fire service to understand health risks all firefighters face. Earlier this year, and Dr. Fent shared the, the work of um, IORC, he noted the reclassification of firefighting as a group one carcinogen. Importantly, the experts that convened in France ruled that these results apply to all firefighters, structural, wildland, career, volunteer, male, and female. Obviously, some cancers identified on this list are not gender specific. Both men and women have bladders and colons, but limited evidence was found for prostate and testicular cancer which in the language of IARC means that the positive association has been observed between exposure to the agent and cancer, but other explanations such as um, technically termed chance, bias, and confounding could not be ruled out without, without, within reasonable confidence. But when you review the list, where's ovarian cancer or breast cancer? Is there not a relationship or has it not been studied enough? In this instance, this is an instance where absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. We know, we know finding significant increases in any epidemiologic study is challenging. The whole healthy worker effect is a factor of firefighting pulls for people who are relatively healthy at the time of entry into the fire service. We also know that people that are healthy enough to work and responding to fires are typically healthier than those who aren't able to take, take on such tasks. In addition, cancer is a relatively rare disease, so capturing cancer rate requires a large sample size. Also, occupational epidemiology that is long-term requires following people beyond their retirement given the latency of many cancers. Data that are often not available, but soon will be. Finally, when looking at cancer registries and death certificate studies, often those who are retired or serving as volunteer firefighters are not captured as active firefighters in that categorization. When ex examining one of the largest studies and most generalizable studies to date, Doug Daniels and colleagues at NIOSH studied more than 30,000 firefighters in Philadelphia, Chicago, and San Francisco. While this is an impressive sample size, note that less than 1,000 were women. Results did not find overall cancer mortality in women, which begs the question as to whether or not the risk is, is higher among women firefighters or not, or if this is an issue of the study sample. The authors found that most cancer deaths were from breast cancer in women, and bladder cancer was the only cancer found to be statistically increased among women with more than a 30-fold increase, but based on less than five cases. When studying cancers even the most common among women, trying to make conclusions based on less than 1,000 women is a challenge. Rates of breast cancer for women in their 30s in the general population is one in 204, and up to one in 42 for women in their 50s. 
But if you look at ovarian cancer, the rate is 18.9 per 100,000 by the time women reach their 50s. It's not surprising that a sample of 991 women firefighters didn't reveal much. Another study that was done in Florida looked at the Florida Cancer Data System. They reviewed 3.3 million records. While the authors identified 3,760 male cancers, there were only 168 female cancers identified among firefighters. While they did find increases in the rates of brain, thyroid, and melanoma for women, the number of cancers identified for women were far fewer than the rates found for men. The question remains whether the lack of significant results was due to study design or a true, true lack of risk. There is research underway to examine health risks among women firefighters. As an example, a research team in San Francisco has been developed. After department personnel noticed a high rate of breast cancer among their members, they developed a working relationship with local researchers. Using a community-based participatory research approach, the team is developing and studying research to examine exposures in the relationship to breast cancer development. Well, the current topic is cancer, and I'm not confused about the presentation. Among women, we also have been looking at reproductive health. You may notice that a lot of the concerns related to reproductive health that have been studied are similar to the risk factors we look at related to cancer. So studying reproductive health, health is a more proximal outcome. Qualitative data has found that women firefighters perceive these issues as severely understudied and of significant concern. In a national study of more than 3,000 women, we found that rates of miscarriage were more than double for career firefighters compared to the general population. What's even more alarming is that the rate of miscarriage among volunteers was even higher, 42% than the rate of, among career firefighters. Results were similar for preterm labor, and they suggest that we may be underestimating the risks of exposures to volunteer firefighters. As is always the case with science, more research is needed, but results lead to questions about what is driving these rates and what other health outcomes might follow similar patterns. Importantly, the work on women firefighters has led to a number of other questions. Are there negative reproductive health outcomes for men? Are there child health outcomes that should be considered for both men and women firefighters? Emerging work is focusing on fertility and other reproductive health issues with concerning results for both men and women who choose to join the fire service. Now, the future of research. While much of this presentation has focused on the lack of data on women firefighters, there are active efforts to understand the health risks women face. With funding from FEMA and under the lead of Dr. Burgess and a national team, the Firefighter Cancer Cohort Study has developed two studies focused specifically on recruiting women, both career and volunteer, and he just shared that 17.8% of their sample is women. The National Firefighter Registry that you heard about from Dr. Kenny Fent will specifically focus on recruiting a large sample of women firefighters to begin to answer questions about rates of cancer and cancer risk. It will be up to each and every one of us to ensure that we are able to recruit a large enough sample of women firefighters and firefighters in general for this important work. Women in Fire has also led the charge in understanding the emerging health issues of firefighters. With both funding from Fire Prevention and Safety Grants and the U.S. Fire Administration, they are taking the health and wellness challenges head on and helping to direct future intervention and prevention efforts. Departments across the country are increasingly focused on the recruitment and retention of women firefighters and seeing a value in adding women to their ranks. For instance, FDNY has more than 150 women, and they are actively working with the scientific teams to recruit their women colleagues into the national studies. The face of the fire service is changing. We are growing and evolving, and the science must keep up with the need. We owe it to every firefighter, every fireman, and every firewoman to do everything we can to understand the risks that come with the job and how to best mitigate those. And now on to Denise Smith. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here and a pleasure to be with this particular uh, panel. Cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death among Americans over 45 years of age. But cardiovascular disease imposes a specific burden in the fire service, and that's what I'd like to talk about in my few minutes with you. As seen in the graph in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, sudden cardiac events are the leading cause of acute duty-related 
line of duty deaths. And that has been true year after year after year. The slide shows you that cardiac events are far more common than burn and asphyxiation fatalities, which we think of as leading hazards. In part, burn and asphyxiation numbers are as low as they are because of dedicated effort by the fire service to mitigate against those risks. And one of the points today is that we can decrease line of duty deaths due to cardiovascular disease similarly through training and education. Not only are sudden cardiac deaths of concern, but additionally 800 to 1,000 reports of non-fatal events occur each year. And these can be devastating for individuals leading to disability, and they can certainly be costly for the fire departments. Now importantly, sudden cardiac events do not occur randomly throughout the day, as you would expect if they were not related to the occupation of firefighting. The data in the lower right-hand side, side of the slide shows that by estimates, firefighters spend approximately 1% of their time engaged in fire suppression activities. And yet 32% of cardiac fatalities occur during or shortly after these activities. We can all see that this is a disproportionate number of fatalities following fire suppression, and statistically, this amounts to a risk about 86 times greater for suffering a sudden cardiac event following strenuous fire suppression activities versus station duties, which might approximate another job or profession. This slide is showing the same data, but for one year. This is the recent data from the United States Fire Administration and sadly, we do see a difference in this data where COVID is the leading cause of line of duty deaths, followed shortly thereafter by sudden cardiac events or heart attacks. But I want us to look even at this data and think a little bit about the connection with cardiovascular disease more broadly. First, I would like to point out that when we think about the burden of cardiovascular disease, we may want to include cerebral vascular accidents, or CVAs, where often they are caused by atherosclerosis in the arteries of the brain. I also want to point out that there is definitely a link between cardiovascular disease and COVID, not all of which we fully understand, but we know enough to be concerned. Certainly you know that cardiovascular disease risk factors, including hypertension, obesity, and diabetes can be related to COVID severity. Furthermore, mechanisms of COVID death often include increased coagulation, pulmonary embolism, heart attacks, or sudden cardiac arrest. Uh, this is an area where I, I think we're going to need and see more research in the future. So if we try to develop a conceptual framework for what accounts for sudden cardiac events associated with the work that firefighters do, we need to begin by looking at the physical nature of the work itself. You all know full well that firefighters perform very strenuous work, uh, multiple tasks, often carrying heavy loads, ascending stairs or ladders, and ultimately even performing rescues, which are arguably the most arduous work. This is done while wearing heavy, protective personal equipment, which is absolutely necessary, but it imposes a physiological burden because of its weight and insulative nature. Firefighters also perform that work in a hot environment, often hostile with dangers all about them. And collectively, this physical stress leads to high physiological strain. Uh, colleagues of mine at the Illinois Fire Service Institute and other researchers have documented the magnitude of this strain in almost every system of the body. For today, I'm focusing primarily on the cardiovascular strain and the related hematological or how the blood itself changes and the related thermoregulatory responses because as firefighters encounter heat stress, this exacerbates the cardiovascular strain. I'd like to take a minute and walk through a model 
where we might try to understand how the typical responses to firefighting intersect with pathoanatomical changes that can be deadly in some firefighters. All firefighters respond to firefighting activity with high physiological strain. In other words, the heart beats faster and harder, so there's more cardiac work. The vessels, the blood vessels themselves change. Not only is there an increase in blood pressure, but the vessels themselves become stiffer. And the blood, the blood becomes thicker, more viscous, the platelets in the blood become activated, and the blood is more likely to clot. Now this happens in all firefighters we've studied, but most firefighters recover without incident. So what we're trying to understand is how these normal physiological responses intersect with individuals with underlying cardiovascular disease to cause the negative outcomes of a sudden cardiac event, fatal or non-fatal. And that requires that we understand different underlying disease processes. Some individuals have coronary heart disease. This is the atherosclerosis or the buildup of plaque in the coronary arteries. There's also hypertensive heart disease caused primarily by hypertension, but also any other disorder, obesity or coronary artery disease that causes the heart to work harder and actually change structurally. So it enlarges in size or the ventricles become thicker. So this is termed left ventricular hypertrophy or cardiomegaly. We would put those collectively under hypertensive heart disease. These two conditions can occur in overlapping fashion, but we need to better understand what sort of underlying disease is plaguing the fire service and how it's related then to whether firefighters are suffering heart attacks, blood clots in the arteries, or sudden cardiac arrest due to arrhythmias. I'd like to share with you some data that we collected in collaboration with our partners at the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, where we had access to autopsy data on all firefighters who have died in the line of duty in the last 20 years if the data was available. We separated those into those who had cardiac deaths and trauma control deaths. And what you see is that among those who died of cardiac disease, 73% had atherosclerosis or coronary heart disease, and 77% had a structurally enlarged heart. And I'd call your attention to the major finding here. 80% of the firefighters who died of a cardiac event had both atherosclerosis and an enlarged heart. And this has implications for the sort of screening we would want to recommend. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see data from our collaborations with occupational health providers. And we see that a high percentage of firefighters have cardiovascular disease risk factors. 69% of them have hypertension. Whether this is due to the vigilance or stress that they regularly encounter, we don't know. Other risk factors are similar to the general population. But again, I remind you, your work is not similar to the general population. So to summarize, firefighting causes significant cardiovascular strain and physiological disruption, but most firefighters recover without incident. But firefighting can trigger a cardiac event in individuals with underlying disease, particularly in those who have evidence both of atherosclerosis and cardiac changes. And so firefighters should be screened for cardiovascular disease. And firefighters need and deserve robust fitness and wellness programs designed to address cardiovascular risk factors and to prevent the progression of cardiovascular disease. Thank you. I now have the privilege of inviting Mr. Port. Mr. Pat Morrison to the stage. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to start with uh, this first slide. 
and uh, today I'm going to be talking about behavioral health, um, some of the issues, PTSD, but mainly about behavioral health. Where, where have we been? What's happening now? Where are we going into the future? This um, was a magazine that we put out in 2015. This was our cover. Um, this was bringing PTSD out of the shadows. It had uh, treatment. Uh, it had stigma. We had signs and symptoms. And we really felt that we needed to bring something out. What we didn't expect was that our phones rang out the hook the minute that this magazine hit, the, hit the, our membership. And people were calling us up and saying, I read the article, and I read myself within that article. I need to get help. What do I do? And those were time and time again, those conversations. People that were ready to end their lives giving us calls. And what, what, what were we doing? We realized then that we had to stop. We thought we were doing a great job. You know, we thought we were heading in that right direction. But we knew that we had an issue that needed to be addressed, and it needed to be addressed immediately. What we know, you know, the fire service, um, we, we, we do have higher uh, uh, behavioral health disorders than the general population. It's said that 22% of firefighters um, will have PTSD sometime in their career. Uh, that, in that 22% population, you'll have 50% of those will be diagnosed with clinical depression and have a higher risk for suicide. We also know that um, one study that 30% of the firefighters had alcohol dependence. No real surprise there, but um, the, of the U.S. general po then versus the U.S. general population. And, and we realized that we had to do something there. Where is our treatment? How do we do that? And we actually did put in a lot of, uh, a lot of treatment programs in, uh, from the international uh, to do that. Suicide, burnout, you've heard that. You've heard it a lot here, recruitment, major challenges, major challenges that we're going to be faced today, things that we have to take a look at, and especially that burnout, that shift work. You know, what are we doing? How are we studying it? How is it affecting us? And it's affecting us a lot on that. The, basically, the connection, and this is where, you know, we, we kind of get disconnected, but the connection between uh, behavioral health and health outcomes. Poor stress management has a direct impact on heart disease, chronic pain, obesity, sleep, and cancer. We're starting to see those tie-ins. It's just not just about, you know, um, you know, I, I have a behavioral health issue. It's all these other issues that are adding up that we have to be really cognizant of. Many barriers in the fire service still exist. You know, the number one barrier that, that we see is, is stigma. And some of that's internal stigma, is saying that I can't go get help. I don't need help. That's for somebody else. That's not for me. And some of it's external. You know, what, what's going to happen if somebody finds out that I went and get help? And that is true. I mean, I remember coming in as a firefighter and running those calls early, early on and just having to really suck it up and really being, you know, doing, doing CPR in a small child is, is something that you just don't go back and have a cup of coffee. But that's what we did and that's what we do. And we did it time and time again. And we have to, we have to change that. We have to change that stigma. And the other is trust. You know, there is a trust factor here. Do I trust somebody that I'm going to go talk to? The EAP, the fire chief, the administration, access to services. And there's a true, there's a true uh, part of cost. How much does this cost if I have this? Peer support, I think, is one of the programs that has effectively helped us in the behavioral health spectrum, more so than any other program that we have developed. We've trained over 9,000 peers across the country. But these are peers that are willing to help other firefighters. And what we have found out, and we even found this out in our treatment center, um, you know, where firefighters were coming to treatment, firefighters there at that center were helping each other, those that came we have been there for a while, and the newcomers coming in, they would just reach out and do that. Firefighters can trust each other. And we really felt that that was a program that we could bridge that gap. Could we get that trust between the firefighters and move that individual, especially if that firefighter who was in trouble trusted that individual? A big, big issue that we have out there right now, and, and we're, trying to, we're trying to get ahead of it, and it's there, but we, we really do need culturally informed clinicians and therapists. This is very difficult. It's really hard to get those therapists that really understand our, our work, what we do, our occupation. And when you get a firefighter and you're going to get him to treatment or he needs to go to therapy, he needs to talk to somebody, 
that first session is so important. If that first session doesn't go right, if, they, if, if, if there's something in there that this therapist doesn't understand, we might never get that firefighter back into that session there. So we are looking for, uh, there's a lot of organizations here that are doing it. Uh, the IFF also, we're, uh, we're pulling uh, clinicians training. We actually have a two-day training program. We're in uh, beta testing right now. And they, uh, those clinicians are actually going through a fire ops um, uh, drill. What we don't know, uh, and, this, and there could be a debate on here, but I, I really want to, you know, you know, suicide is a big thing. We take it so serious, and, and it's, you know, it is, it's one of the saddest things that uh, when, when I hear it, when, when I, we get the phone call that someone has uh, committed suicide in, in the ranks of ours. We need a national database. We need to track this. We have to track this. You can say this, you can look at these numbers, but if we don't have that national database, we can't make the claims that it's increasing or decreasing. We have to have that. We have to have that soon. We also know that when a firefighter dies by suicide, is it due to occupational factors or demographic factors? We need to understand that. If we don't understand that, we're not going to get the training programs. We're not going to get the education out there. We're not going to understand why is this happening within the fire service. Sleep remains, you know, uh, to me, one of the biggest things that we kind of just fluff off, you know? What we're seeing right now with the sleep deprivation, truly none of us are off. We can see us, us in here. We're constantly being bombarded by our, our cell phones, our connection. How do you disconnect? How do you get sleep? We are seeing studies now. If you're not getting six hours of sleep, you know, your body just cannot handle that. That is not what we're made of. But how do you do shift work? How do you balance that? What are the things we don't know about that? We're going to have to take a look at that uh, much, much closer in that sleep pattern. I think another area that we're really concerned with is how do we translate educational awareness um, into that behavioral change? And how do we do that? You know, we know what, we, what we're supposed to do, but we just don't want to do it. And that's, you know, that describes a lot, of, a lot of us in here. How can we get programs that we can effectively have behavioral health change? Can we measure them? We have lots of research out there. They're on lots of shelves. How do we take that research and apply it into the fire service? How do we, um, the next one, I'm just going to, on this slide here, um, the, how do we attract and retain millennials born 1990 to 1995 and Gen Z born 1995 to, to 2012 um, to the fire service? And the reason we say this here, because this is, a, this is a nationwide problem. Fire service has never had a harder time recruiting candidates in this occupation. What does that say about the job? And where can we create organizations where, young, where people want to work? Policies do we need have to be in place. Today's younger workers value autonomy, career, mobility, work-life balance, and knowing their workplace cares them above all else that we care for them. And I congratulate the recruits are here too. So I, I love millennials and Generation Z. I, I, I raised three millennials. I just don't want them to move back. That's all. That's all. <laughs> Uh, real quickly, this is organizational resilience. I really want you to take a look at this. I don't have time to get in depth in this. We always talk about individual resilience. We don't talk about organizational resilience. I can go to any fire department and someone will say that, well, our, we have a BA, uh, behavioral health program. It's our EAP out there. That is so far remote from what's actually happening in there. And I really want you to take a look at this to build that organizational resilience. Because when you build it, you will build the programs that when somebody gets in trouble in your department, they have some place to go to get that help. And you have to have that in there. And we really need to, to discuss this at, at length at some other time. We'll bring this back up. But I just wanted, we hear it, personal resilience. But I tell you what, our organizations need to get resilient. Um, and just real quickly, I'm going to go down. These are some of uh, creating a resilient workforce, um, uh, you know, that, that, that we know today that we have to that we have to continue to do. Comprehensive fire department behavioral health programs. We've made a lot of progress, but we have a lot, lot of, uh, a long way to go. We feel mandatory behavioral health education for all ranks uh, to affect change. Education, normalizing the behavioral health conversation must start at the very beginning of the career. And recruits, we've, we might have scared you here. We've got a lot of information. This is still the best damn job in the world. So don't worry. <laughs> We 
have to look at, and I'm, I'm finishing up here, um, targeted outreach, inclusion of leaders. And this includes, you know, the leadership. We, too much about we have our membership. But I think the leaders, the chiefs, even our affiliate leaders, they struggle too. And their wellness has a ripple effect on the rest of the organization. We need to take a look at that. Annual behavioral health screenings and evaluations. Be prepared to see big changes in NFPA uh, 1582. It's actually going to be 1550 in that. And in increased treatment access through telehealth. Telehealth was a game changer for us. We've studied that. In one study, 61% of firefighters, 85% um, completed treatment, an average of 15 sessions, reported sis, uh, significant system reduction in PTSD, depression, and generalized anxiety. Firefighters like telehealth. They don't, that's their privacy, it's trust, it works, they'll access that, and I think we can do that, and even in the volunteer service, in places we can't reach in those areas there, we can, we can have those um, there too. And we need to improve um, outcome treatments, like I said before, for that uh, culturally informed care that the IFF, uh, we are trying to, to get more clinicians out there in the field that know our role. And the last thing, the role, this is, there is a big uh, space for the role of science in the cutting edge behavioral health treatments. Healing trauma is just not about talk therapy anymore. There are so many programs that are emerging that we need to understand the effectiveness for the fire service. I want to, um, uh, thank my staff at the IFF Health and Safety. Without them, all of our programs wouldn't be in existence today. They do an amazing job. Thank you very much for the time. What a significant panel. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, all of you. I asked them just to stay. Uh, we, as you see, are well ahead of schedule, and that is due to all of our panelists today uh, staying on point and presenting amazing information. So I hope you all listened quickly, uh, not just in the room, but our online watchers as well. So with that, this does conclude our United States Fire Administrators Summit. I do want to recognize once again our recruits in the room. As uh, Pat Morrison just said, you've heard a lot of very heavy information. In fact, I had staff lean over and say, I know why you have a recruitment problem. Who would want this job? <laughs> so we do want you to know that we are working very hard, as you've heard today, at reducing the fire problem. Because the way to keep you safest and healthiest is the fires you don't go to. Right? This is what we have to do. So prevention, community risk reduction are huge pieces of what we have ahead of us. But our continued efforts to make sure that we continue on with our health and safety, our behavior health, and certainly awareness in research in cancer, cardiovascular, behavior health, and certainly our uh, minorities, women issues particularly. So with that, I want to thank you all for being part of today. This was a historic event, as I said in the beginning. I think it has been marked even more so as the day progressed um, today. So leaders, for you, this is just the beginning. The recruits now, uh, I hope you picked up and will appreciate, maybe not today, but in years to come, the significance of you sitting in this room today uh, because of what will happen based on this meeting. And I hope that this meeting is cited in history in years from now. Because today is just the beginning. Tomorrow, many of you will stay with us in another session where we begin to say, what next? So we've laid it all out on the table today, but what next? Each national organization will have a participant at the table tomorrow. Our researchers will be present, and our governmental affairs experts will be engaged. They will join in a strategic discussion about what next. So once again, only the beginning. I have to stop and make sure that once again that I thank all of my staff, USFA staff who have worked tirelessly along with NFFF staff, 
uh, to make this happen. Uh, behind the scenes, this was a yeoman's effort. Uh, and so if you would join me, please, to thank them once again. With that said, I will now close the 2022 USFA Summit on Fire Prevention and Control. Thank you all for joining us today. I would like to now turn this over to Dr. Lloyd Foreman. <laughs> I forgot to say that.